Ottawa, and CJET 1011 Smith Falls. City News Time, 9 o'clock. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, April 22nd. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and Smith Falls, it's six degrees, and here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Well, we have breaking news from the hockey world this morning. To his fans, he was Guy. Just Guy. The family of legendary Hab Guy Lafleur announcing his death at the age of 70 from lung cancer. Here's City News reporter Simon Bennett. The Montreal Canadiens take up a significant section of the Hall of Fame, as we mostly know, but only a handful can be really referred to as legends. And Guy Lafleur was one of them. Not just the numbers, but flying down the wind and the hair blowing in the breeze. Lafleur, a big part of five Stanley Cup champion teams. He had 560 goals for his career. He electrified fans of the four. Now, the younger fans might remember his return after a few years away in the 80s with the Rangers and then ending his career in the late 90s with the early 90s with the Quebec Nordiques. Now, he had been battling health issues for some time, quadruple bypass surgery in 2019. Then the year after that, they announced that his lung cancer had returned and he had been battling that for the last two years or so, that battle finally ending. Guy Lafleur, a Montreal Canadiens legend, reportedly dead at the age of 70. Simon Bennett, City News. Now, more on the Thurso Quebec legend coming up on the Rob Snow Show this morning. Almost Fittingly, the Habs play their next game in Ottawa tomorrow night, basically Lafleur's backyard. Their next game after that is in Boston. Against the team, Lafleur scored his most famous goal in Game 7 of the 79 Stanley Cup semifinal against the Bruins. Guy Lafleur, dead at the age of 70. City News Time 902. Now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Any leftover cloud will move out. Sunshine for the afternoon for Ottawa. The Valley Smiths Falls today. The high about 12 degrees. Tonight mainly clear in one. And for the weekend, quite a bit of cloud. Highs near 10, 11 degrees. For today, the high 12. And right now in Ottawa and in Smiths Falls, it's 6 degrees. Commercial and real estate property owners can apply to the city tax deferral program. Today is the last day for this. It's for downtown businesses who are affected by the Freedom Convoy over the winter, and the city says they were hoping for a higher uptake. City News reporter Chris Curry is now with details, including word another convoy is on the way. The program is open until end of day and is for businesses in the downtown core, from Cathcart to the north, King Edward to the east, Catherine to the south, and Bay to the west. City Deputy Treasurer Joseph Mahoney. In a normal year, there are two installments to pay property taxes. One is due in March, and the the other one is due in June. So if a property then applies for this property tax deferral, they can defer both installments to September 15th of 2022. He says it's a great program that will allow business owners to keep cash in their pockets as the spring and summer rolls through. It's timely as well as another convoy has made its intentions known. The Rolling Thunder Auto Group plans to make an appearance next weekend. A group of motorcycles. Police tell me they will be providing an update to the public on the motorcycle convoy on Monday at the next police services board meeting. Chris Curry's City News. City News Time 903. Now the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, says that in the eight weeks since Russia invaded Ukraine, international humanitarian law has not merely been ignored, it's seemingly tossed aside. Her office says Russian forces have indiscriminately shelled and bombed populated areas, killing civilians and wrecking hospitals and schools in what may amount to war crimes. The High Commission office in Ukraine so far has verified 2,300 forces. 45 deaths. It says the actual number is likely going to be much higher. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's got the news and the views. He's got views on the news. It's the Rob Snow Show on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. First Mike Bossy. And now Guy Lafleur. It's tough. Yeah, it's tough to say goodbye to the stars you grew up with. Good morning. Welcome to the Rob Snow Show. It is Friday. We did make it, and let's all be thankful. 
for that. Coming up, he's been minding Ottawa's business all week long. Tom Korski is the managing editor of Blacklock's Reporter, keeping an eye on how those in power spend your money and how they make the decisions that they make. One of the things today, and I've been thinking about this, is there anything, anything, at citizenship and immigration that is actually working well? The Afghan refugee situation is, it's a mess. The situation with trying to get information about resettling Ukrainians, it's not much better. Social media is filled with horror stories about people waiting to either get their passport or renew their passport. I'm not looking forward to having to do that. I hear that's a, it's just a total gong show. And now... Blacklocks is reporting the bla- the backlog, the backlog for immigrants. These are, okay, they're trying to become Canadian citizens. All they need to do is take the oath, attend the ceremony. That backlog, sixty thousand people. They've paid all the fees. They've passed all the tests. They've, be, they've probably been waiting to become a citizen for years. Years. All they need to do, have the ceremony. Have the ceremony. But hey, if it's your turn today, sorry to tell you, there are 60,000 people in the line in front of you. It seems like a department that's just a complete shambles. Just is from end to end, top to bottom. Inside and out. Shambles. So that is one of the many stories that we'll talk about this morning. Tom Korski from Black Locks. Derek Fage is going to join us, as he always does, on a Friday morning, host of Daytime Auto on Rogers Television. We're going to talk about some local issues like widening the Queensway. Uh, This news came out yesterday. Just kind of um, like a passing reference from uh, Caroline Mulroney, the transportation minister in the Ontario government. She was stumping in Glengarry Prescott Russell. See, the PCs think they have a good shot of taking that seat back. You know, the seat they actually won four years ago until the MPP crossed the floor, elected as a PC, crossed the floor to sit with the Liberals. Samard, Amanda Samard, crossed the floor to sit with the deeply unpopular Liberals because she was upset about uh, funding for Franco-Ontarian programs. But the PCs have a a very good candidate in that riding. Stefan Sarazen is the mayor of Alfred and Plantagenet. So that is a riding to watch, my friends, on election night. But anyway, that's when Mulroney made this announcement about the provincial government. It wants to, it's going to widen the Queensway. From Maitland to the 416, it'd be four lanes in each direction, no timeline or anything. It was just kind of a vague pre-election announcement because such is the season. But holy smokes, cue the outrage and so predictable you could set your watch to it. From the downtown lefties trotting out the tired old argument, induced demand. Don't widen the highway. Haven't you heard about induced demand? Well, don't you know what it means to induce something? Do you know what that word means, induce? Induce means you're trying to uh, persuade someone to do something or, or you're trying to stimulate something. Induced labor. Induced Okay. With all due respect, when it comes to traffic on the Queensway, given the growth that has happened in this city and the growth that is yet to come, this is not inducing demand. It's trying to catch up with demand. The demand is already there. It's not being induced. <laughs> You're not inducing the demand. Okay. But it is quite a worldview some of these councillors have. I have to give them credit. They, we, we, lo- we want people to live in Ottawa, right? But we just don't want them to be able to afford homes. 
And we want people to live in Ottawa, but heaven forbid that they have roads to drive on. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Speaking of Ontario politics and the upcoming election, man, it's been raining money in Ford Nation. It really has. I think Doug Ford would throw money out of helicopters if he could. $10 billion in counting and pre-election spending promises. Meantime, the Liberal leader, Stephen Del Duca, is promising that if the Liberals are elected, they would ban all handguns in a year. And poof, just like that, easy peasy lemon squeezy, no more gun crime in Toronto. Did you know it was that easy? All you have to do is ban handguns. Here it's about widening the Queensway in the northwestern part of the GTA. It's all about another highway, Highway 413. You're going to hear an awful lot about that highway, Highway 413, during the election campaign. We're going to debate all of these issues today. We'll be joined by a panel of MPPs for something we call the Queen's Park Week in Review. We will talk about hockey today. We will talk about the, the passing of the Habs great Guy Lafleur. News just breaking this morning. Liam McGuire. Can't think of a better guest this morning. The great local hockey historian, trivia master, and massive Habs fan will join us at 11 o'clock to reflect on the life, the legacy of Guy Lafleur. And so will Steve Warren from the Sens Nation podcast. It's actually the Ottawa Senators hosting the Montreal Canadiens tomorrow night for our hockey night in Canada. So I am sure that there will be tributes to the flower tomorrow night on hockey night in Canada. You bet there will. Between 10 and 11 o'clock, hey, it's all about you, right? And your phone calls and your opinions during the talk back hour and the Friday free for all is today. We're, we're, we're open to just about anything. We'll kick around just about, just about any topic. I mean, we're open-minded people. We, within reason, we're open-minded people. We've come up with topics all week, and we've quite enjoyed the discussion. But today, you feel free to throw something out there. You come up with a topic, and um, we'll see where it goes. Pierre Polyev owns a condo in Calgary. Well, he doesn't even own the whole thing. He's a part owner of a condo in Calgary. It's an investment property all over the media. And the allegation is that makes him part of the housing problem because he's a real estate and uh, speculator. He's a speculator. And his wife is a speculator because she owns an investment property in Orleans. So is that fair? Is that fair? A third of the Trudeau cabinet. They all have investment properties. A third of the Trudeau cabinet. I guess they're all housing speculators too. Maybe you want to comment on that. Or maybe you want to comment on uh, widening the Queensway. We can get into that. You know, I hear these clips that we're playing in our newscast. Councillor Kavanaugh. I really like Councillor Kavanaugh. But Councillor Kavanaugh says nobody's commuting anymore. Okay. So why should we spend money on a highway, she says. Fair enough. Okay. Why are we still funding OC Transpo like it's 2019 and the pandemic never happened? How about that, Councillor Kavanaugh? Why are we doing that? Maybe you want to comment on that. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Whatever happens to be on your mind, we're willing to take your opinions out for a test drive right into the weekend on The Rob Snow Show on City News. If you're lucky, you may be getting a return of about 2% on your RSP. And here are the rest of your Ottawa 16. Sean Callahan from behind his own net. Moskowitz, there's a giveaway. Here's Byer, shot right on. Mrazek has it. Ottawa has, uh, for the most part, carried the play in the last three or four games here, and this is when Barry's got their chances on 
Poor puck management, puck decisions right there. Ill-advised pass, not a good pass, a turnover. Creates the first scoring chance and shot on net for the Barry Colts in this game. This is what I was going to do better of tonight, is making sure that their puck management is good. They're crisp when they're solid when they have it. It's the first action. Scores! The Barry Colts draw first blood. It's Greg Such. Smith out there now for Ottawa. He's going to head in front of the net. Oh, dig it away, scores! Dalton Smith tapped in front of the net. We are tied at one. Back to the point. Callahan shot's blocked. And here comes McDonald with a head of steam. Shot scores! McDonald with the long shot. And the Barry Colts take a 2-1 lead. Back to the point. CC walks. Shot scores! Tony CC. It might have been deflected right away, at, uh, right when he took the shot. Something changed yeah. on the way to the net. It dipped as it got close to the net. I, I noticed that. And uh, good, good cycling. Gus does a great job of being patient with the puck, bringing two guys to him. And he'll win it back to the point. CC. Here's Prince. Traffic in front. Down low. Trying to get scores! With 24.1 seconds to go. Be a nice thing. Oh, waved off at the last second. Bahena trying to track it down. Rolls deep into the Ottawa zone. CC to meet him. Trying to center it. Bouncing pocket. The Chris scores! With 8.7 to go. Mark Shifley ties it at three. Force McNeil to hustle back. Niederberger steers it away. Gustafson right on it. Scores! Brad Gustafson from the boards. The Ottawa 67 advance to the Eastern Conference Finals. The little man comes up big for the Ottawa 67s. He'll never score a bigger goal. No, that's for sure. Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Nine seventeen Friday morning. He's been mining Ottawa's business all week, and he's back to go over some of the big news stories at Blacklock's Reporter this week. Managing editor Tom Korski. Good morning. Well, hi, Rob. Great to hear from you, sir. Thanks for taking the time once more. My pleasure. Tell us about the the cannabis company that briefly employed Liberal Ottawa Centre MP Yasser Nakfi. Yeah, he was a director of this company. Even company, they lost money uh, as a marijuana distributor. How do you lose money in drug dealing, Rob? I thought it was a recession-proof business. I was misinformed. I guess. I guess. Uh, unfortunately... It was a pandemic. They blamed it on the pandemic. It, they uh, actually right? did. Right. I love that. They blame it on the pandemic. It, it, People gold. were smoking more pot during the pandemic, but never it, It's gold. Yeah. Uh, he was a director right up until the day after he was elected a member of parliament just back in September 20th. Okay. Uh, problem. The company is now insolvent. It, they just filed for bankruptcy protection in Superior Court over on Elgin Street. The problem is they owe uh, Canada Revenue Agency almost $2 million in back taxes. Wait, wait a minute. Wow. Yeah, I understand only little people pay taxes, but if you're an MP and a parliamentary secretary and a director of a c company, let alone a marijuana company, that owes millions in back taxes, that's not a good look for a legislator. Okay. Eve and Co. This is the name yes. of it. Eve and Co. Okay, so he, people may remember, he was... Um, a provincial cabinet minister, powerful one. He was the attorney general um, at the time. He was actually in charge of coming up with, at the time, Ontario's <laughs> marijuana policy, yes. right? Because we were kind of on our way with this. And then he lost in the election uh, in the, when the, all the win cabinet ministers were getting blown out. And um, Yasser Nafi went down to defeat in Ottawa Centre, lost to the uh, New Democrat, Joel Harden, Kind of stayed out of the limelight, and, uh, and then 
came back in the most recent election and won as a federal member of parliament in Ottawa Centre, but it's kind of in the interim he was working as a director for this company. He's, that's right kind up of the until, timeline, uh, right? Yeah. Absolutely, that's exactly right up until last September 21. He, the only reason he quit is because he got elected. <laughs> Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's uh, continue with um, Blacklocks continues to dig into the nooks and crannies of all the aftermath of the uh, truckers protest here in Ottawa. And, you know, we have a news story here on on City News that, you know, the city is encouraging businesses, please subscribe to our program. Uh, you know, we, we have a we're running a program. You could be eligible for some compensation if your business was affected by uh, the truckers' convoy. Uh, you have a story about that today at Blacklocks. What's going on with that? It's interesting, Rob. There, there's something wrong when the governments can't literally give away money. And they're trying to give away money, in this case grants, up to $15,000 for businesses that claimed hardship during the blockade. Uh, our newsroom technically has a street address on Wellington. We've now received two letters uh, nagging us to apply for grants not interested. W- why does this matter? Well, we, you, we see some data. Their grant applications are down 40% from what they thought they would be, and the payouts are nowhere near what was claimed. CBC had claimed $200 million in losses. The Feds budgeted $20 million. Payouts, which, by the way, the expiry for applications is end of the month, next week, payouts to date are about 800000 Why does that matter? Because Cabinet had in- invoked this as justification for declaring the Emergencies Act. They said, look at all the economic harm. Well, let, let's follow the money. It doesn't add up, Rob. Right. So, so far, with the clock ticking on this program, it's le- been less than a million dollars. And it's free money. I mean, free all you money. have to do is apply <laughs> for it. All you have to do is right? <laughs> exactly. like, like, As you said, they're begging you to apply for it, right? Right. You're saying no. You, you know? So anyway, that is that is curious. It is really curious. It's almost like cabinet made up justification to invoke the Emergencies Act. I, I don't want to just blurt that out, but it's starting to look that way. Now, I was always skeptical skeptical about Canada Post plan to get into the retail banking business, like the brick-and-mortar banking business. Uh, and I've talked about this repeatedly over the years with Professor Ian Lee uh, from the Sprott School of Business at Carleton University because he is equally convinced that it's a silly idea because what does Canada Post know about banking? And when you look at, at the banks, they can't close brick-and-mortar bank bank branches fast enough. <laughs> so um, while that's going on, you have Canada Post uh, you know, with this plan. Well, we have to do something about our own bottom line here at Canada Post because of the drop in, in letter mail. Uh, let's get into the banking business, and we can do things like moneygrams. So, how's that business going? Uh, not so great. Uh, no, no, you don't say. You don't say. That's I know. Uh, management in a uh, report to the Commons Government Operations Committee. So, uh, two years ago, they signed this contract with MoneyGram for cash wire transfers from there. As they say, the post office often points out we have the largest retail network in the country, over 6,300 outlets, coast to coast. And they say their uh, mar- their profit was marginal, quote unquote marginal. Now I have to tell you that Canada Post management is not famous for lowballing. So if they say it was marginal, you can you know that that is marginal. Uh, they have a problem, uh, Rob. Their, their financials are going to be coming out in a couple of weeks. Uh, the year before, they lost over seven hundred million pre-tax. The losses are very serious at the post office now. And both management and uh, their unions are desperate to find some use for this incredible network that they have that goes back, you know, 155 years. It's a problem. It's a 2021 pre-tax loss was 775, 779 million dollars. It's staggering. It's staggering loss. Wow. For a year. Like Canada Post is losing $2 million a day. Yes, absolutely right? staggering. My gosh. And it, as I, if I recall, they're 
I don't know what the situation is like now, but their pension plan was woefully underfunded as well. So, uh, so they know that yeah. successive cabinets, Rob, have said there was a conservative cabinet that uh, investigated privatization, and there is now a liberal cabinet that has done research and saying, okay, let's start looking at service cuts. Let's go back to three-day-a-week mail delivery, for instance. And they have polled Canadians about, will you pay more? Will you tolerate less? There, There's... It's quite a desperate search. Over yeah. it. Their finances are terrible. Yeah, okay, okay. You know, I hate to be so down and doomy, gloomy, but, oh. I mean, we are talking about the government here, and as I said in my opening remarks, I, I, gosh, is there anything that's going right at Citizenship and Immigration Canada from the Afghan file to the Ukrainian file? The passport situation is a mess. People trying to renew passports, big lines for that. Um, you can't get anybody on the phone, apparently. What's the backlog for um, citizenship oaths? Makes no sense. So it's, it's over 60,000 people. They paid their fees. They passed their test. You would think once you've passed the test and paid your fee, you take the oath on your way to the parking lot. No, 60,000. They say, we want to aim for the stars on a service standard. You know what their service standard would be? Four-month wait. By the way, there's <laughs> been federal court rulings, Rob. The citizen, uh, citizenship oath is not some mere formality where you raise your right hand. It's a legal requirement. There was a Saudi businessman who passed all his tests, paid all his fees, never got around to taking the oath. And a federal judge said, forget it. That's a, that's a very serious matter when you swear allegiance to queen and country. And they can't even do that right. How do you have a 60,000 backlog? Right, it makes right. no sense. And, and, and they're, again, all they're waiting to do is, you know, I swear allegiance to da 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 whatever, whatever the oath says. I don't know what it It literally says, takes 15 like, seconds. Yeah, 15 <laughs> seconds, right? right. We, have a, our, our, we have a target. It's like a, our standard of excellence. Four months. <laughs> well, Four welcome months. Welcome to Canada. <laughs> welcome, welcome aboard. <laughs> yeah. well, the thing is, you know how long it takes to become a citizen? It's like a year's long process, right? So, I mean, it's crazy. All right. Electric cars. Governments can't, can't trip over themselves fast enough to outbid one another to offer rebates for electric cars. But according to the Department of Natural Resources, what do Canadians actually say about electric cars? Yeah, people not like. They uh, look at the sticker shock. Yeah. Difference in price of fifteen to twenty-five thousand. They have a lot of questions about battery performance in the winter. Well, anyone who's done anything with a battery in minus twenty mm-hmm. knows the name of that tune. They have questions about resale, and they also have questions, according to in-house research, as you point out by the Department of Natural Resources, about how long does this battery last anyway? Because statistically, most Canadians drive cars right into the ground ten, twelve years. Am I getting a 12 years worth of performance out of my Tesla battery. Well, there's no one to ask because there's no one in Canada who's been driving a Tesla for 12 years. A lot of cynicism despite the offer of rebates, Rob. Okay. Hey, great stuff again. Very interesting uh, news reports this week from your team at Black Locks, Tom. It's why I'm a subscriber. Keep up the great work. Thanks again. Thank you kindly, Rob. Yeah, Thank bye-bye. you very Tom much. Korsky from Black Locks Reporter. The host of Daytime Ottawa. Derek Fage will join us next here on City News. There's always behind the story.
number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, April 22nd. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith's Falls, some scattered showers, also some sunshine and 7 degrees, and here's what's making news this hour. Montreal Canadiens legend Guy Lafleur has died at the age of 70. Lung cancer, he had been recovering after surgery, the reason for the death, at least given by his wife on social media. A great tribute to the Hab former and last number 10 in that storied club's history on sportsnet.ca. The Habs next two games, by the way, right here in Ottawa tomorrow night, Lafleur from Thurso, Quebec, and then on Sunday in Boston against the team for perhaps Lafleur's most famous goal was scored in 1979 playoffs, Guy Lafleur dead at the age of 70. The wave of pre-election campaign announcements continues today from major parties in Ontario. One of the latest from the Liberals is trees. 800 million trees will be planted at a rate of 100 million each year in the next eight years. Stephen Del Duca as Premier promising every family will have access to that tree bank. You can withdraw one and plant it on your own property. No cost was fixed to that promise. UN Human Rights Chief says international humanitarian law appears to have been tossed aside in Russia's war in Ukraine. The Geneva-based Human Rights Office today says it has growing evidence of war crimes against civilians as Russian armed forces appears to have indiscriminately shelled and bombed populated areas. The Ukraine mission has verified nearly 5,300 civilian casualties, but adds the actual number is going to be much higher. City News Time 932. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Firm. Fair. Fun. The Rob Snow Show returns. On Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM. And 1310 AM. Still ahead on the Rob Snow Show, City Councillor Riley Brockington, the Councillor for River Ward. Lots of things happening at City Hall this week. Especially on the OC Transpo file, public transit file. And now yesterday, this news about widening the Queensway. We'll get his his thoughts on that. And let's explore some of those issues and more this morning with the host of Daytime Ottawa, Derek Fage. Welcome back. Great to be back. How are you, Rob? I'm okay. Well, it's kind of, I'll tell you what. Okay. It's kind of a okay. downer of a day, actually. What's uh, going on? Well, yeah, quarter after eight this morning or so, we all, we heard that Guy Lafleur had passed away. Yeah, so, seventy uh, years old. Hard to believe. Yeah, it's just. I, I um, mean, you know, I know his health hasn't been good for some time, but you know, yeah, uh, yeah. these days that's that's a young man, right? You know, last week it was old. Mike Bossy, like Mike Bossy. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just. Yeah. These were. It, you know, maybe. <laughs> Maybe a, I may have been a little bit young, but I remember Guy Lafleur playing for the Montreal Canadiens. Oh, me too. You know, absolutely. So, yeah, um, I was a I was a Montreal fan at the time. Right. You know, growing you know, up, like just I was my team. You know, I wasn't a Habs fan, but I was a Guy Lafleur fan. How could you not be a Guy oh, Lafleur yeah. fan? Right. The yeah, the absolutely. style, the flair, the hair. I mean, <laughs> he he had it yeah. all. Right. He had it all. So um, yeah. it's kind of oh, sad, I and I you know he's I, I it's. I can't imagine how, how the they're feeling in Montreal right now and in Thurso, where he was born in Thurso, and yeah. you know, just um, he, he, well, if, and, and you know, think about those teams. I mean, he was those he was the best player on some pretty good Montreal Canadiens teams. He won five Absolutely. Stanley Cups, right? So, yeah, and if anyone can do a um, a tribute. Uh, you know, do it well. Uh, it's the Montreal Canadiens organization. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. And they, they do it better than, than any other team in the league, no matter whether you like them or not. No, yeah. That's one thing they do incredibly well. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's just tough. We're, we're getting at, at this age, you know, where... Yeah. You know, you're starting to yeah, say goodbye right. to some of your stars, you know, that you you, you watched, you know. So, anyway. Well, yeah, your stars and, and people you grew up idolizing and yep, your yep. family too, Rob, yep, right? Yep. That, when so, you get to our age. Absolutely. You know? So Liam McGuire um, is going to join us a little later in the program. Oh, Can't think of any better guest to speak of. Of course, he's like the hockey trivia master and it yeah. is <laughs> a massive Montreal Canadiens <laughs> fan, right? So. Exactly. No, he's uh, he's the perfect guy to, to talk Guy Lafleur with, that's for sure. Yeah. 
Like he has a he has one of those seats from the old Montreal Forum. Remember? The, yeah. Like he has one right. of those. Yeah. 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 So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you and me. Did you have a good Let's week? Talk. Yeah, yeah, good week? yeah, yeah. No, it's been a great week. That's Absolutely, good. that's good. Yeah, things are rolling along really well. Okay. What do you think about widening the Queensway? Well, I mean, this has been in the works for years. You know, it's going to be put on the plate of, of Doug Ford. Oh my God, the Conservatives! Look what they're doing when we're trying. We've got a climate climate crisis. emergency. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It's got the climate emergency. A little and what Jeff Leeper money that could be spent on improving transit to the suburbs and you know. The problem, though, Jeff, is that, you know, as a city, we built the suburbs terribly. I mean, people have to get it. People that live in the suburbs, you know why they don't get on light rail and the bus for the most part yeah. is because on their way home, they have to stop and get groceries. I mean, my brother lives out there. If he wants to go get a coffee somewhere, he's got to jump in his car. He cannot walk to a cafe. He cannot walk to a restaurant. Yeah. He can't walk to the grocery store and back like I can here in in Vanier and, and many of us, you know, can do sort of in the in the downtown core. Yeah. The problem is you built the city wrong, and that's <laughs> why we need to widen well, the bloody queens. And I'm, I'm not putting it on this no. council. I just mean in general. We have we've done a poor job in North America of building cities, especially our suburbs. Well, I mean, it's, it's I mean they're they're going to use this term induced demand that right. when you. Add a, a lane to a highway. You widen a highway. You're inducing demand, and you know five years from now the traffic situation is not going to be any better. Well, I don't think this is. I don't think this is inducing demand. I don't think so either. I think it's trying to keep up with demand. Like the demand is already there. People like their you cars. Know? I mean, I think even people forget. Even, you know, even like, more so now after the pandemic. It's clear in the absolutely. ridership of OC Transport. Listen, it's even obvious. cyclists own cars. You know what of I mean? Course. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Th There's always this argument between cyclists and drivers, and oh my goodness, the cyclists, why don't we As like As though they could never be one and the same person, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, you yeah. know what? I own a bicycle and I ride a bike. I also own a car. So, you know, this this conflict between, you know, these two groups, let's just yeah. relax on that. Con yeah, do we need more bike lanes? Absolutely. Does that mean people are going to stop using their cars? No. It just, yeah. it, I mean, it's the very few people that just use it only as, as, a, as a commuter vehicle for themselves, right? Most of us use our bikes recreationally yeah. to go, yeah. you know, down to plus, the park. Plus, back um, it, what's wrong with widening roads or even building new roads? Okay, Nothing. this is a growing city. Um, yeah. For what else other part of infrastructure do we not do this? Okay, let's take for example. I'm going to cite. I don't want to scoop myself, but uh, you know, I've been, I was I've, I've been doing some research this morning. Just population estimates for some of the suburban communities. Okay, you know, over thirty over a thirty year period, going up, say between the year two thousand and the year twenty thirty. Twenty thirty is not that far away. No. Over that period of time, the population of Barhaven will have increased 160%. Yeah. Okay? In 30 years. Uh, to 110,000 people, which would be a fair-sized city in any other province. Right? 110,000 yeah. people. Absolutely. Um, we wouldn't say, well, we're not going to build any police stations or fire stations or schools. or, um, but, but we expect people to drive on the same old rickety roads. Um, well, and you want to bet that you want to bet that ninety percent right? of those people that live in Barhaven own a car, right? Oh, well, uh, yeah, but no, they, actually, uh, about sixty percent of them own two cars. Well, they yeah, go <laughs> right? right because they have to. Yeah. So, right? and it's just ridiculous to me. It's not about induced demand. It's about keeping up and building infrastructure to meet the growth of the uh, of the city. I agree. I mean, you know, let, let's say, you know, we finally get that stadium downtown. Am I going to drive to the stadium? No, I'll, I'll get on the LRT and I'll, yeah. I'll go to the hockey game and, and come back home. But when I go to work the next day, I get in my car. Right. And this is another thing. And I only bring that I was meeting friends for dinner out in Canada last week. And um, when you are going up the, the Canada Hill, now the light rail, the end of the phase two of light rail is starting to take shape and you can see what it's going to look like out there Yeah. in the West End. Yeah. It just ends. 
I know. Like, in the <laughs> middle of nowhere, it just yeah, it, like it just ends. And I asked Councillor Hubert because I'm not familiar with what's going on with Canada with light rail, um, right. but it's just like that's where it ends. Oh, yeah, those it ends it, are you going to have a Are you going to have a park and ride there? No, we're not going to have a park and ride there. You're going to get the park and ride. You have to get into the park and ride at Eagleson, which is ridiculous. So yet, right? So go to the park and ride at Eagleson. To take a bus. To take a bus. <laughs> to take a bus. Literally, like, I don't know, what's that bus ride going to be? Five minutes, like, down the Canada Hill to get on the LRT? And, well, and you've got to wait know. for it, right? And you've got to wait for, for it. To arrive. You yeah. know, there's an extra 15 minutes to your uh, hour and 15-minute commute if you're working, you know, in Ottawa from Canada. I don't know. <laughs> so, we, just, we've just some of the crazy of things that we so, building so, the city. So, um, all right, let's move along. Let's move okay. along. Okay. All right. I've I've quite a few things I want to say about that a little later. So I don't want to. I don't want to. Okay. Don't scoop. I don't want to blow off all my steam just <laughs> yet on you, Derek Phage. Okay. Tw- uh, the, the Twitter sphere says you would swear Twitter is not real life. I get that, but you scroll through the like comments about Pierre Polyev, you would swear because he is a part owner of a condo one condo in calgary yeah. part owner right part owner uh he doesn't even own the whole thing right you would swear yeah. he is single-handedly causing the housing crisis <laughs> uh, like he is he's the biggest hypocrite housing speculator you would think this condo the way they make it sound it must be like trump tower this condo oh, um uh, yeah yeah <laughs> And don't forget his wife owns a, a rental property in Orleans. In as well. Orleans. So as a family, they own one and a half condos. I guess, yeah. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that does make them, I guess you could say, speculators. Well, um, yeah. Are they part of the problem? Are they? Does it make them hypocrites? Are they part of the problem? What do you think? I don't, yeah. I don't think so. No? You know, okay. I, I, I've talked to you before. You know, I'm not a big fan of Pierre. No, I know. Yeah. I, know. I, I think yeah. he's going to. I think he's going to win. I, I just don't think he's the right guy for the party. And this is coming from someone that you know vote, has voted conservative. I, I, I would love to see somebody you know in in the conservative party that could that could you know boot out the Trudeau government. I have not been happy with with. Prime Minister Trudeau's government, um, but I just don't think Polyev is the guy that's going to be able to do it. But let's yeah, let's look at this issue. So first of all, you know, people that go on Twitter and lose their minds, you know, this is what bothers me about social media and Twitter in particular is that people just read that headline and then they do no research and don't realize that a third of Liberal MPs also own rental property, so they're part of this so-called problem. But the issue to me is the lack of affordable rental properties like apartments. You know, the more the, the more the more that we see these expensive condos built, the more that we're going to see them owned by owners who are seeking additional properties, you know, for their portfolios, right? I mean, that's, I'm I'm sorry to say, but they're just, the the condos themselves are so unaffordable to the next generation that that's what happens, Mm -hmm. that these these types of people buy an additional property, put it in their, their portfolios. And, you know, I think what, I think what also people forget, right, is this, This next generation, and I've spoken to David about this, don't forget there's this great wealth transfer that that we're eventually going to see from one generation to the next. It's going to be in the, you know, in the trillions. It's going to be unprecedented. So you're going to see these, you know, middle class to wealthy families giving while you're living, right? It's it's going to be a big option for for many people. But, you know, that still leaves out people that need affordable housing. And I think we keep saying housing and in people's mind, psychologically, they think, they think single family home. Those aren't the types of homes we need. We need to build apartments like we see or dwellings like we see in Europe that are five and six bedroom apartments. You know, whenever we build an apartment complex or a condo, it's two and three bedroom, that's it. So, you know, a family of four or five, where do they go, right? Right. Okay. And where, where do you find it affordably in, in any city uh, right across the country, you can't find it, and that's who's being left out. Who's being left out are the people that are working two jobs on minimum wage, not not the middle class, in my opinion, and and the wealthy. They're going to be just fine, thank you. Okay, is Rolling Thunder? Have you heard about this? Oh uh, my goodness! Yeah, yeah. could be. Uh, I don't know how many dozens, hundreds, thousands, whatever, whatever. Uh, yeah. Bikers coming to Ottawa for some Horns kind of to be replaced by the revving engines of Harley's. 
Yeah. So, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they'll, they're loud enough, too. Um, so the, I gather, just from what I've seen on the Internet, the plan is uh, they want to have a bike rally at the National War Memorial. Yeah. For what reason? And the mandates got to end the mandates. Uh, what, like what, what mandates? I don't know. I, I'm not. What, I don't speak on behalf what, of the bikers. Which, okay. Which restriction? But I guess uh, you know, given the lessons learned, what should the police do ahead of time? Should they even let them set up shop, or is it like keep on rolling, Thunderdome? I don't know. It's uh, almost impossible, right? How did, How are you going to stop them from rolling into town and, and rolling into the downtown? I guess you could put up, you know, blockade. Sure. Um, I, I think. Probably what they might try to do is what they did last time, right? When that smaller convoy came in and they let them roll through and just okay, just keep on going, keep on rolling out of town. But these guys are saying they want to they want to stay, right? Mm -hmm. Their idea is they they want to stay until May the first, and I don't know, are they going to set up camp? Are they getting uh, you know hotel room? I'd be interested to see if any hotel rooms downtown are starting to get booked solid. And I don't think they're here to protest. They're here to party. I mean, it's still <laughs> happening. And really, Rob, it's still happening every weekend in cities across the country yeah. where, you know, you're having these smaller protests. And it's the same gang that keeps coming out. And it's an opportunity to party and have some fun. I, I, I really don't think it's much of a protest anymore, except that they hate Justin Trudeau. That's their protest. We hate Justin Trudeau. Okay. okay. Well, set up your barbecue and hate Justin Trudeau, I guess. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, you're on fire this week. Look, great to hear from you. Have a great weekend, Derek. We'll talk to you next week. All right. Take care, Rob. Bye-bye. Derek Fage, host of Daytime Ottawa Rogers Television, city councillor for River Ward. Uh, Riley Brockington coming up next. We'll talk about widening the Queensway. We'll talk about uh, OC Transpo and some of the challenges facing public transit in the city. Coming up next here on the Rob Snow Show on City News. Beautiful flooring that can stand up to almost anything.
opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Riley Brockington is the city councilor for River Ward. Back with us this morning on City News. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. Thanks for having me back on. How you doing? I'm well. It's Friday. Yeah, that's nice. But what does that really mean for a city councilor? You've only got, what, five or six things to go to? Uh... Tomorrow's the big day. Oh. Birthday's today, hosting many events tomorrow in River oh, Ward, birthday. including an, an e-waste depot if you want to unload your electronic waste. Okay, okay. Wow, that's uh, thrilling stuff. Uh, <laughs> the <laughs> Earth Day, I wouldn't even have known if you hadn't mentioned it. Um, speaking of Earth Day, this is uh, nice. The provincial government announced uh, plans, kind of vague, uh, no timelines, dollar figures, anything like that, but plans to widen the Queensway from Maitland to the 416, four lanes in each direction. What's your reaction to that news? Well, I'd like to see a strong business case for it. Obviously, it, the Queensway is not just for Ottawa residents. It shuttles people through the city from east to west and vice versa. And uh, as you know, we've spent $5 billion on LRT, which is our major public transit system in the city, which needs to take prominence uh, as opposed to more and more money for Queensway expansion. So, you know, I live in reality. You need to be able to move people and goods in the city uh, through multiple modes, including the Queensway. I'm not opposed to the Queensway. I just haven't seen the business case when we're, we're spending so much on public transit yeah. and, and need people to take transit. Well, are we spending too much on public transit? I think that's, you know, that, that's a big question right now. I, I, how would you describe ridership levels on public transit right now? Well, uh, COVID has, has decimated ridership uh, decimated, across, right? yeah, across yeah. Canada, across the world. Many, many cities have rebounded. Uh, others struggle. I, I put us in the struggling stage. We have, in particular, two large cohorts of, of riders, federal public uh, workers and uh, post-secondary students who are not riding uh, transit in any large quantities compared to pre-COVID, and that's hurting OC Transpo's bottom line, frankly. Um, and that is a huge concern going forward with sort of the hybrid model that the federal government has announced that they have embraced and will embrace going forward. Uh, the numbers uh, just won't be the same, at least in the short and medium term, compared to pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, the system uh, for ridership was doing well as far as numbers. We are, the latest numbers in March, about 49%. And March, March 2022 is the, the highest level of ridership for OC Transpo since COVID hit, and we're not even at 50% yet. So that is a significant challenge, Rob. Yeah, it's yeah. the loss of revenues, and how do you sustain this going forward, the whole system, because bus routes will have to change. The the rush hour buses from the suburbs coming downtown simply don't have the people, and you have to look at uh, re reacting to and providing service for that, that, new, that new model. It seems to me that there's been a shift in focus for municipal councils, maybe away from we need money for capital investment into transit. Certainly the federal government has been there, so has the provincial government in this city, willing to write big checks for capital investment for light rail projects, for new electric buses, whatever the case might be. Right. Gas tax revenue. Um, it's shifted from capital to operational now. You, you need money just to operate the system now, because right? Of, yeah, because of yeah. COVID. Uh, historically, you're right. Uh, upper levels of government have uh, provided contributions for large capital projects that municipalities just couldn't pay for yeah. on their own, and, and that's been appreciated. The federal government has mused with getting into the operation side of public transit. They thought, or they've made uh, statements that by 2026, they might be contributing to the operating side on a consistent basis. During COVID, they have stepped up. Yeah. The only way OC Transpo has been able to balance their budget during COVID is through uh, contributions from upper levels of government. 
but going forward that might be an additional revenue source for municipalities so that's something that we're working on we've urged them to speed that up let's not wait until 2026 uh, but at least the feds have have mentioned that this is a possibility right right but see here in Ottawa we just don't have to deal with the COVID problem. We have to deal with the fact that our major employer that employs 138,000 people in the national capital region, a lot of those people are never coming back to the office. That yeah, is I, I think a that's the major reality, yep. challenge. A major challenge. Um, so let me ask you this then. Mm-hmm. If it's not going to be used the same way as it once was as a commuter service, then what do you think about maybe a reorganization that turns commuter routes and puts them into more, say, a, a, a local service route. Oh, that has to happen. It As has I to said, happen. Okay. I said this week at Transit, we have to know where our riders are coming from. Okay. And the general manager indicated they are going to do a, what's called an origin destination study where you try and find out where are your customers getting on, where are they going to, where are the greatest demands for service coming from, how can you put resources and greater attention to get even more people taking trans in those routes. So is a reor coming? I think so. It, I just can't see how you maintain the system as is pre-COVID years after COVID when thousands and thousands of people who were taking it to come downtown simply will not be coming back. So, you know, find out where you can redeploy those resources to maximize ridership. You've got to make changes. So it, it's going to be, I think the next term of council will be this reorganization phase. We don't know how long upper levels of government will continue to bail out public transit systems across the country because of the lack of ridership post COVID. If they pull the plug, let's just say hypothetically next year you're not getting any more money we're in big trouble oh yeah then you're in big trouble yeah for sure yeah yeah absolutely i agree hey are you running in the election absolutely i am uh, definitely running again uh i love what i do there's significant work still that i'm passionate about in river ward and across the city and i will be on the ballot in october okay Thank you, Councillor Brockington. Nice to hear Thanks. from you, sir. Thank you, Rob. Yep, bye-bye. Thank you. Riley Brockington, City Councillor for River Ward. Talk back hour. Friday free-for-all is coming up right after the 11 o'clock. No, 10 o'clock. Not quitting time yet, Rob. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock news is coming up next with Andrew. And then I'll take your calls at 750-1310. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. Being a crossing guard works great as part of my schedule as a high school student because I still have time to do my tests and assignments while earning a little bit of cash on the side. It fits, working as a crossing guard fits into my current lifestyle because it gives me a lot of time during the day to pursue hobbies that I'm very interested in. A friend of mine introduced me to this job. Uh, I didn't know it was actually a, a paid job. I always start my day. It's a very little, I guess, few months, baby. And she always comes with her dad on a pram and uh, the smile she has, like, oh my God. Well, I think the OSC is a, a very good employer. Uh, they, they show quite clearly that they care about you. They're very polite. They really make you feel like you're part of a family. It's fun. I really enjoy it. Gets us out of the house, too. Yeah.
IWW 1310 AM in Ottawa. And CJET 1011 FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News. Now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, April 22nd. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 9 degrees in Smith Falls, 7. Here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Montreal great Guy Lafleur has died at the age of 70. City News reporter Simon Bennett has that story. Yeah, nobody electrified the crowd at a Montreal Forum quite like number 10. Lafleur coming out rather gingerly on the right side. He gives it into the mayor back to Lafleur. Remember that one against the Bruins in the 79 playoffs? Moments to remember from Guy Lafleur, who lost his battle with lung cancer. Five Stanley Cups, including that Habs team that won four straight from 76 to 79. But there was no one who played like Guy, streaking down the wing, that hair waving in the wind. Now, it's been a rough couple of weeks for the hockey world. There is a picture out there that surfaced on social media. He and Mike Bossy shaking hands after a playoff series. Both hockey stars with Quebec roots that left this earth a week apart. Lafleur had his share of health battles in recent years, cancer in his lungs, was found by chance while undergoing quadruple bypass heart surgery in 2019. Guy Lafleur, the flower, was 70 years old. Simon Bennett, City News. Now, while the Canadians are in Ottawa for a game tomorrow night, it will be their tribute at their next home game that Sunday night against the hated Bruins. The Lafleur tribute will be something to see. City News time, 10.02. And now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Any leftover cloud will move out. Sunshine for the afternoon for Ottawa. The Valley Smiths Falls today. The high about 12 degrees. Tonight mainly clear in one. And for the weekend, quite a bit of cloud. Highs near 10, 11 degrees. For today, the high 12. And right now, 9 degrees in Ottawa, 7 degrees in Smiths Falls. Hospitals are feeling the impact of COVID-19 not from an increase in patients necessarily, but staff shortages. Our Kevin Meisner now at Queen's Park as the province's hospitals grapple with that and the consequences. COVID infections are again taking a toll on Ontario's health care system, this time the result of so many nurses and doctors off the job sick. In some cases, surgeries are being delayed or cancelled. Even emergency department hours are being reduced in some cases. This week, Hamilton Health Sciences CEO Rob McIsaac said his team is managing. You know, our surgical activity is up to 80% of uh, pre-pandemic levels, which is something I'm proud of our team for having been able to accomplish despite uh, many of the challenges challenges that we're seeing with staff. The Toronto Star reports over 2,900 staff are currently off sick at the province's 14 largest hospital systems at Queen's Park. Kevin Meisner, City News. City News time, 10.03. A Russian military official says a second phase of its operation in Ukraine has begun. The aim to establish full control over the eastern industrial heartland of Donbass in southern Ukraine. We get more from reporter James Longman. For the first time in this war, Russia has now confirmed something that Ukraine has long been warning about. A senior Russian commander has said that Putin's army fully intends to control the whole of the east of Ukraine and the south of this country. And right in the heart of that area, Mariupol. Now, the U.S. the latest to pledge dramatically ramped up delivery of artillery guns to Ukraine as the escalating battle continues in the Donbass region. City News Time 1004 add another current councillor to the list of those who will be reoffering in the fall. River Ward's Riley Brockington telling the Bob Snow Show this morning a lot of work he would like to do not only for his ward but the city. So he will be offering his name on the ballot in the October municipal vote. And just before nine this morning, Ottawa firefighters called to Lower Town Brewery, an employee called 911 reporting a grease fire in the kitchen of the building. It's on York between William and Dalhousie. First crews on scene three minutes after the call was received. They found smoke and flames which had spread from the initial source, a deep fryer. The fire was contained to that area of the kitchen, quickly put out, minimal damage reported, no injuries either, and the smoke now is being ventilated from that building. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. And it's a Friday free for all. Our favorite hour of the week around here. We don't come up with the topics. You come up with the topics. We just do our best to roll with it. Whatever happens to be on your mind, we're ready to go. Or we'll pretend to be. 75... <laughs> 
Uh, let's get right to the phone lines here. Some people have called in. In Morrisburg, Bob, you're on City News. Bob, good morning. Hi, Rob. Hi, Bob. So I'm calling uh, to say how Trudeau and his budget didn't do anything for seniors or for veterans. Okay. I'm I'm a senior, and I have to work to survive still. Yeah, and I'm yeah. I'm 69. 69. Okay. Trudeau and Trudeau has done nothing for them. There, there's going to be more seniors and veterans homeless with the way the rents are going up and stuff because they're not going to be able to afford it. Well, plus, what 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 is the plan for CPP? What's the plan for OAS and GIS? We had the inflation report came out this week. 6.7 percent yeah, highest since 1991 now it's probably even it's probably uh even stronger than uh, going back to 1991 because 1991 was a uh, kind of a blip because it was um uh, that was the year the gst came in so some economists are saying no this is the strongest inflation since 1983 so uh, yeah. um it's pretty crazy you know but if if you're on cpp oas gis Gosh almighty, and that's pretty much all you have. You're going to be in tough. Yeah, if you if you only had that, like if I only had that, if I if I wasn't continuing to work, yeah. I I wouldn't be able to survive. Yeah. And I'm I'm one of the lucky ones. Like I rent from my nephew. Okay. A uh, room and it's it's way cheaper than right. what the rents are out there. Yeah, if you had to go I, in and pay market rent, to, <laughs> you know. I'd be homeless. You would be homeless, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Holy cow. All right, Bob. So, anyway, Rob, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's an excellent point that you raised, sir. Yeah, it's an excellent point. Uh, Richard, in Canada, you're on City News. Richard. Good morning, Rob. How are you? I'm good. Richard, thank you. What's on your mind today? Uh, I'd like to discuss the uh, a recent proposal by Mr. Del Duca to ban handguns in Ontario. Yeah, what do you think? Um I really can't believe that any thinking person will believe that this will have an iota of effect on the crime that's existing right now within Toronto. Yeah. We all know that the crime is primarily a consequence of the gang activities, and the way to get around that, first of all, is to look at the illegal importation of firearms from the U.S., yeah. to focus on gang activity, and yeah. then have programs for use diversion. I think that those three elements alone will reduce the crime. Banning guns from legal gun owners who are not part of the problem is just simply virtue signaling. Yeah. It doesn't do anything to affect the problem, and I can't believe that he would come up with something so ridiculous. You, you should run the Liberal Party. Uh, yeah, well... <laughs> You make a lot more sense than it, he does on this issue. I have, I, I agree totally, one hundred percent, with what you're saying, Richard. I, I, I absolutely do. It's, 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 it's not, it's not nothing, but you can see nothing from there. Richard is what it is. You, you may as well be doing nothing on the gun crime in Toronto if you really think just banning handguns is going to make the problem of gun crime anywhere go away just by banning handguns. I mean, are the bad, bad guys really say, oh, I was, I, you know, I was going to do this drive-by shooting, but, oh, handguns have been banned. I better not. Come on. Nepean, Bill. Good morning, yeah. Bill. Hi, Bill. Yeah, hi there. Good morning. Hi. Um, I want to speak on the transfer way in ways that I think could help a lot. Okay. Certainly, I would use it a lot more if you took off all these huge buses, um, improve the service to the subways from the burbs okay. a lot, and then people would use it a lot more. The cost of the buses would be less, so you wouldn't have to charge so much. The servicing of those buses wouldn't be so much. The other thing, you've got to make it interesting for people to use the subway to go downtown, which we need the, uh, uh, the life to come back to. So we need to spark up uh, Spark Street, mm. uh, all kinds of, make it a playground, lights, mini casinos, all that sort of thing. Okay, okay. And, and light up the canal. Make Spark Street look like Vegas, the strip in Vegas, Bill, or what? I mean, put life back, put life back into it. Yeah, okay. And, and fire up the canal for crying out loud, you know? Right. 
side. Okay. You go into these European cities there with the with these LED lights are all over. They make it so interesting to go down there. We just have one dark spot. You drive along the canal at night. Boo, you know. Mm. Okay, okay. But we got to make it interesting for people to go back downtown. I don't think it's going to be a business place much longer. It's going to be a place for people to go, and you've got to create it. So that's a free service from me. <laughs> All right, Bill. Okay. Thank you so much this morning. Thank you, Bill. Thank okay, you. Bye-bye. Thank you for your call. So there's a few lines available there. It's a Friday free for all. This is the Rob Snow Show, and this is the Talk Back Hour. Uh, up next, Jim in Stittsville. Good morning, Jim. You're on City News. Well, good morning. First of all, I don't own a handgun, don't plan to. And uh, why don't they turn the transit way into a mega bike path? Okay. okay. What I'm calling about is I wanted to confirm your earlier uh, guest. Are, are, was I correct in hearing that they have built this multi-million, billion-dollar LRT station at Moody Drive and there's no park and ride? That's what I heard, yeah, and I interviewed Councillor Hubley, who's the chair of the Transit Commission. You would think he would know, and I asked him, is there going to be a park and ride? And he said, no, you have to use the Eagleson park and ride. That, that is beyond approach. Uh, it just amuses me. Yeah. Like, isn't that kind of crazy? I mean, the plan is eventually with phase three, but the city says we're not going to pay for phase three. They want the upper levels of government to play to pay for all of phase three. And that's what's supposed to get further into Canada, like out to Eagleson, Terry Fox, and into Barhaven eventually is phase three. Eventually, in 20 years. Right, but where it ends right now... Have you seen where this thing ends? I could go by it uh, probably once right. or twice a week. It kind of ends at the equestrian right center, there. right? You know, Wesley Clover Park, I believe. Yeah, like if I wanted to ride a horse, I, maybe I could, um, you know, ride my horse. <laughs> <laughs> what are all those huge buildings there for? Does anyone know? They, they've built like it looks like maintenance. Yeah, there's a maintenance going to be some maintenance stuff there. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. our city planners hard at work. But it's kind of crazy, right? That it just sort of. Ends. <laughs> it, uh, thank God, civil servants don't have to go to work. I mean, can you imagine going to park well, in your car with the crowd at, at that Eagleson, waiting 15 minutes and getting on a two to five minute bus ride? Uh huh. That, but here's another thing, though, commute. Jim. But here's another thing. I was speaking to somebody just a few days ago about this because the big complaint about the Eagleson park and ride used to be if you weren't there by six o'clock in the morning, you couldn't get a parking spot in there. But now, with so much work from home in the federal government, uh, he said he drove by there the other day, and when normally there would be 400 cars parked there, and 50 of them would be illegally parked and complaining that they got tickets from bylaw, there might be 50 cars in that parking lot now. Honest to Pete. Right? Uh, so what are we doing? Uh, and then, then one of your mm-hmm. the callers or one of your guests said that houses, oh, no, it was... Um, the mayor said earlier on uh, yesterday or today mm-hmm. that the property taxes next year are going to go to the true value of your home. And well, they're doing the impact assessments, yeah. So all these that's been delayed because of the pandemic. They haven't done impact for on the on the proper schedule. So people whose homes right now, the last time they were assessed at whatever they were assessed at three fifty or four hundred, they're in for some big sticker shock. These are going to be million dollar homes. Million dollar homes, yeah. Good God. Yep. Enjoy that, Jim. Thank you. Elmont, here I come. Okay, all right. Thank you. Yeah, bye-bye. Anthony in Ottawa, you're on City News. Rob, thank you for taking my call. I uh, heard Bill earlier talk about ways that we can spice up the transit way so that we get a higher usage. Mm-hmm. And I think he's on to something, but I think Spark Street and the Canal should be transform into a red light district like they have in Amsterdam. <laughs> make, okay. make prostitution legal. Well, get all the skanks from Instagram. Right, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Come on. Come on. Come on. It's the public airwaves. When, when you talk on the radio, you know, pretend you're talking to your mother. You wouldn't talk to your mother that way. Have some class. Have some manners. Have some respect. It's community television as well, for crying out loud. What are you, what are, what are, what are you thinking? Lose my number. 1015, Rob Snow Show, City News. Trading in your puffy jacket. 
We're talking about preparing your car for spring. And Mike, the next thing that comes to mind, and I think a lot of people probably feel this way, is that, you know, windshield washer fluid. Like, why do I even bother using summer fluid? Why don't I just keep that winter stuff in so I never have to think about it? What's the difference between those two exactly, Mike? Pretty much uh, one one has a lot more alcohol content than the other, and that's the winter, uh, the winter washer fluid, and that's going to help uh, de-ice, it's going to keep everything good, and then most importantly, it's not going to freeze when it's, uh, when it's up, whereas um, the summer fluid, it's more of a... I almost call it like a bit of a degreaser, right? Like okay. they, they uh, it, it's good for getting bugs off, you know, bug spray wash, that type of stuff. All the grime and junk that can come and hit your, uh, hit your windshield in the, in the summer times. It, it's, it aids a little bit more like that and it doesn't have as much alcohol content. So it is a little more susceptible to freezing in the, in the winter months. Well, we also know that winter is very, very hard on the interior of your car because you know, you're getting that in and out of the car, that salt and sand and so forth. Um, salt stains are a big, thing for people that especially if they're cleaning the car themselves any recommendations in getting rid of those salt stains uh, salt's the worst especially if you if you don't have like a like a rubber winter liner or a rubber floor mat or something in the winter time it just can cake everywhere and it and it gets very hard and it calcifies and it's it's some nasty stuff but you know what just a very very simple fix half water half vinegar and okay. you mix that into a spray bottle or something like that and the vinegar the acid in it just softens all that stuff up and then you can uh, wipe it off or vacuum it out it's a good uh, it's a good little household uh, um, uh, hack there if you will yeah uh, Mike I'm embarrassed to say and I said it to you off camera so I'll be honest on camera wiper blades I've probably had mine for four years and I have noticed that deterioration has been happening you know much longer than 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 should be how often should we be changing our wiper blades I mean probably one of the biggest things we should do right for safety reasons for sure and and, and you know what it is one of those I don't blame you one bit it's it's one of those things that if it out of sight out of mind right if right. it works it works and if it doesn't that's when it's time to do it but <laughs> really um i would i would highly recommend replacing them at least twice a year you know just going into the summer and then going into the winter uh that's that's generally a good time frame because it's one of those things that is just you take for granted it's so important uh to be uh to to to, to, to have proper wipers so that you can see out the windshield and if they don't at one little point or the bra blades start to to rip or deteriorate rate it's uh it's not going to be a good situation yeah. so highly recommend about uh about twice a year if you can and you're able call now 613-750-1310 see why you have to add the proviso within reason Within, we're willing to talk about anything within reason. That's why. What a dink. That's a total dink. 1018, uh, 1018, Rob Snow Show, Friday free for all. See another major news story about the fact Pierre Polyev owns a condo. Well, he doesn't even own the whole thing. He's a part owner of a condo, partly owns a condo. One condo. Partial ownership. His wife owns a rental property in Orleans, and I, I guess this, the narrative in the media, I guess, is it makes them hypocrites because Polyev is talking about trying to bring down the cost of building new homes, trying to use the levers of the federal government to get the gatekeepers, the gatekeepers, to speed up development by tying um, infrastructure funding, for example, to home construction. There was some language in the budget that hinted that may be on the way anyway. You want a billion dollars for your public transit system? You have to approve this many building permits, something like that. Something like that. Is it wrong? Let me ask you this. Is it wrong that Pierre Polyev owns a, an investment property? Does that make him a hypocrite? Because he's a housing speculator, a housing investor, and it's people who own more than one property that are, they are responsible for the housing crisis? What do you think? What do you think? I'd love to have your take on that. The news media, I'll tell you what, they're really sinking their teeth into uh, the Polyev real estate empire. You'd swear they were the Trump's partial ownership of one condo in Calgary and a rental property in Orleans that his wife bought with her own money before she ever met her husband. But uh, no matter. Not much uh, uh, other than a passing mention about the one-third of the Liberal cabinet that also 
own investment properties. Oh, and by the way, you know, a third of the people with actual power in the government, they, they, they do it too. But there was, you know what, this was a juicy nugget from Global News about the liberal landlords. I'm just going to quote here. Minister of National Revenue, Diane Lubutillier, stated in her forms, you have to submit forms to the Ethics Commissioner, right? Submitted in her forms that she holds a significant interest in a Quebec general partnership that rents out cottages in St. Therese de Gaspé. End quote, okay? So she's in the tourism industry in addition to being an MP. owns a significant interest in a Quebec general partnership that rents out cottages. So you have a minister of the crown has a vested interest in making sure the gas bay, which is a lovely place to visit, making sure the gas bay is a good place for tourism. Okay. She's in the cottage rental business after all, by her own admission. She had to, di- di- to disclose it under the law. I bring this up because usually around election time, what happens? We're seeing it right now here in Ontario. You get all the election goodies. The pork. The pork. The government pork. Okay? And I have seen this minister's name on many, many a press release over the years. Pork for tourism in Gas Bay. News releases issued by the government about funding announcements, election goodies, like this one. April 7th, 2021, the Honorable Diane Le Boutillier, Member of Parliament, Gaspise, Les Îles de la Madeleine, today announced $930,000 in financial support for Camp de Basse Coin de Banque Club de Ski de Fonds in Gaspise. Okay. Skiing in the Gaspé. February 23rd, 2019. That was a million dollar announcement, $930,000. Government of Canada announces new investment to support winter tourism in the Gaspé region, $633,000. Most of it went to snowmobile clubs. July 24th, 2019, the Honorable Diane Le Boutillier, $500,000 investment that will allow the Explorer Museum to acquire a new sea vessel for its marine excursions to support tourism in the Gaspé region. <laughs> May 26, 2021, $2.7 million from the same minister. Financial support for the city of Gaspé for the development of a new tourism attraction to promote Riviere du Renard's heritage as the coastal fishing capital of Quebec. And that's just a snapshot. What do we have there? 2.7, 3.2, 3.8. Four point, almost $5 million in three years? One minister? One liberal cabinet minister in the Trudeau government? Who has a significant interest in the tourism sector? <laughs> significant interest in a general partnership renting out cottages in St. Therese de Gaspé. She is in the tourism business. And yet, as the MP gets to dole out millions and millions and millions of dollars and makes announcement after announcement and cuts ribbon after ribbon, government money for the tourism industry in the Gas Bay. But she's a liberal, and I guess she's not Pierre Polyev, and she's not running for prime minister. Pierre Polyev owns part of a condo in Calgary. And it's like, all over the news. <laughs> it's crazy. John in Rockland. John. 
Good morning. Yeah, hi, John. Uh, yeah, uh, looking or hearing the gentleman about the true cost of paying taxes for the property uh, in Rockland for every one hundred thousand of evaluation, it's fourteen hundred dollars property taxes. Now let's assume that in Ottawa, house I have friends where houses have gone from five hundred thousand to over a million. Yeah. We're talking seven. Eight and nine thousand dollars in one year that they'd have to pay more in property taxes. Something is going to break. Yeah, it, it just doesn't make sense. And I know people who have those houses; they've worked very hard. I mean, sure, um, they they have two jobs, and how are they going to come up with ten thousand dollars extra in one year? Mm. As the mayor, as anybody? Yeah, I don't know if they'll go up that much. I don't know if they'll go up that much. It'll be interesting to see how much they go up. It, it's something to pursue for us on Monday, actually, now that I'm, I'm starting to think about this. Yeah, well, will the impact? Is, you know, if you, the last time your house was assessed at a half a million and now it's going to be assessed at a million, what's that going to do to your property tax? Well, well, as I say over here, I because my house was evaluated at 200 and I paid 2800 in property taxes, right? Divided, it's fourteen hundred per hundred thousand. Right. Okay. 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 I ain't happy. I bet you're happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I, happy. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, you're not happy, but you're happy you're not paying Ottawa taxes, though. For sure. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. This line in uh, Ottawa, Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Hello, Barbara. Hi. Sorry. Hi, Barbara. I have my Go, phone on me. That's okay. Um. The gentleman called earlier about saying that, you know, he was 69 and he still had to work to pay for things. Yep. Um, I saw a news thing the other day where Doug Ford was asked about uh, if the government was going to do anything for people that are recipients of ODSP, the yep. Ontario Disability yep. Support Program. Yep. I have a daughter who's on ODSP. She has a genetic disorder and she's not able to work. Yeah. She receives eleven hundred and sixty nine dollars a month. Oh, I know it's a disgrace. Yeah. And I see all these programs that they're doing and Doug Ford's response when he was asked about it, he said, Well, there's lots of jobs out there available to everybody. Right. But what about the people? Like the reason she's on it is she has a disability. I know. Yeah. Those people aren't really capable of working and yet you're you're expecting them to live on just over twelve thousand dollars a crazy. year. Yeah. The housing amount that they allow each person is four hundred and seventy five dollars a month. I know. For their housing. Yeah. In this day and age. Yeah. In Ottawa. A anywhere. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like it's where are you supposed to live on four hundred and seventy five dollars a month, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then never mind paying for anything else. Yeah. Um, you know, t like nowadays, you can't even have a television unless you have some form of either cable or internet because everything's digital. It's not analog That's anymore. Right. You yeah. can't put a TV antenna up and have free TV like, you know, we used to have when I was a kid. Yeah. You only had 13 channels, but they were free. <laughs> I suppose. You know? yeah. And there's none yeah. of that anymore. And, and, and yet the government keeps throwing money. I hear them, you know, sending like, Paying money for all of these factories and everything else, yet they do nothing for, for the, the poor, vulnerable, the people. poorest of the poor. Yeah, the poorest. And if she yeah. works, if she were to work, oh, they claw it back. Yeah. Well, they give her an extra hundred dollars a month. The first two hundred dollars she earns, they don't claw back anything, and then after that, they claw back fifty yeah. percent of everything yeah. Yeah. she makes. Yeah, and if in any I given month I know. she makes more than what her the clawback is for her ODSP, she loses her ODSP. Yeah, you've made the perfect case for the basic income. This is why we... But, it's but uh, nobody, nobody will ever do this. Nobody in government would ever do this. Uh, and I have to run, Barbara, and I thank you for your call. Um, she's just made the case for the basic income, but it only makes sense to do it if you eliminate a program like ODSP and replace it with basic income. And you eliminate... The other big social welfare program in Ontario, which is Ontario Works. Why do we need two programs for the poorest of the poor? Halftime talk back hour Friday free for all Rob Snow Show City News. Shea 106 plays the icons.
in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, April 22nd. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 8 degrees at 7 in Smith Falls. Here's what's making news this hour. The second hockey legend in a week has died. Guy Lafleur, former Montreal great, died from lung cancer, according to his wife on social media, at the age of 70. Much more on the life and career of Guy Lafleur coming up on the Rob Snow Show with guest Liam McGuire in the next half hour. Of course, Mike Bossy's death was just announced last week as well. Quick action to call the fire service and quick work by them once on scene. Just three minutes later, it contained a kitchen fire at the Lower Town Brewery. The worker called 911 to report the grease fire in the kitchen just before 9 this morning. Damage was minimal to the kitchen and the building did have to be aired out. COVID infections taking a toll on the 14 largest hospitals in Ontario. So many healthcare workers are off due to illness. In some cases, surgeries are being delayed again. Out of the 14 largest hospitals in Ontario, at least 2,900 staff are out. River Ward's Riley Brockington says he will re-offer in the full municipal vote. He told the Rod Snow Show this morning there's a lot of work that he would like to continue doing in that capacity, not only for his ward, but for the city. City News Time, 1033. I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. Second half of the Friday free-for-all. So we have some topics, but we would much prefer it if, if you had your own topics. That's kind of the spirit of the Friday free-for-all. So 750-1310, 750-1310. 613-750-1310. Paul is in the Byward Market. Paul. Good morning. How are you? I'm good, Paul. How are you? I'm good. Oh, uh, Paul, I haven't heard from you, Paul. A bit of a Paul. concern and uh, some thoughts that went through the mind. And uh, do you remember a little while back you were talking about uh, the city uh, wanting to tax people that had uh, vacant properties? Sure. Yeah, vacant property tax. Yeah, yeah. Sitting yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, and we yeah. have the federal government pushing for uh, having the backs of uh, the middle class. Sure. The middle class and those working hard to join it. Yeah. Right. And then we have all these MPs that have uh, investment properties and so what, yep. what not. Yeah, 60 some. Yeah, yeah, right. 60 of them. Yeah. And then we have what I consider the silo effect where one, uh, one level of government can tax another. That's right. Yes. But I wonder why. Like, whose bottom line is being protected here when you have 24 Sussex Drive that's been vacant for how long here in the city of Ottawa? And because of COVID, you have all these federal government buildings that are vacant. Yes, yes. How, why, why couldn't the, uh, the city of Ottawa recoup some money because of that? Seeing that well, the federal, government, the federal government is still paying. It's, still, it's not necessarily paying its tax. What it does is it has what's called the PILT 
uh, payment in lieu of tax. So all right. of that is being calculated, and there, there, there are payments going from the federal government to the municipality. The, the, the question is, if those are no longer federal government buildings, what happens if, for example, I don't know, yeah, uh, they're not federal government office. Ta- what if they're not federal government office tax? towers anymore? Let me finish, Paul. Sorry, if they're not federal, if they're not federal government office towers anymore, they're owned by a, um, another developer and their housing units. Then the city is not going to get the payment in lieu of the tax. Uh, if the federal government decides to whatever oh, okay. bull- bulldoze Twenty Four Sussex and it's bought by another country and they build an embassy there or something, then they're not going to get the property tax on 24 Sussex. Right, right, okay. Yeah. No, I, I was, I was uh, you know, it, it gave me food for thought. I was wondering, yeah, you know, good. it's like, because the federal government and, and other government, it, it's all a question of bureaucracy, you know, and I sure. call it the silo effect. The silo and, effect. and they're going yeah, after the good. little and middle class people uh, to do what they want them to do, but they can't even do it themselves. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Glad to hear. Glad to hear from you. Don't be a stranger. Okay, Stephen in Ottawa. Stephen oh. in uh, it says Alta Vista. Go ahead, Stephen. Hi, Rob. Hi, I Stephen. called a little earlier with regards to um, issues that uh, uh, involving COVID, and I just wanted to bring you and other listeners up to date that um, I was advised yesterday that um, eye surgery that I had uh, scheduled uh, for yesterday has been. Uh, rescheduled because my physician um, has fallen ill. Okay. I, they didn't tell me why, but um, I suspect uh, from conversations I had it is possibly COVID related. And um, now uh, my uh, surgery has been triaged uh, to another physician. So I have, you know, absolutely no idea when my surgery is going to be completed. And um, I'm just a a little tired of having our premier um, and his elves that are known as ministers running around the province giving millions and billions of dollars away um, when we aren't properly funding and caring for the health care system that uh, we very heavily rely on. So um, I just I just wanted to, I think, bring it to the voters of Ontario's attention that uh, um, our premier is as smart as a stone, <laughs> and um, I call him dump truck because okay. that's about the intelligence that he has. Okay. And that's I just feel nice. that uh, we, we cannot, this province cannot, under any circumstances, afford another right. Ford So what's the alternative? Government. What's the alternative? Well, the, the alternative is whatever other than Ford. Whatever. It's, it's, whatever. Like, it's like they had in Newfoundland, ABC, anything but conservative. Right. Because, quite frankly, okay. as you long do as they're you, you know, uh, 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 You do, you do remember that the Liberals were in power for 15 years, Stephen. Well, exactly. Right? But, quite do, frankly... Do you, do, you, do you think all of these problems in health care, they just, what, sprouted up over the last... Three and a half years or so? On, no, uh, but since I, Doug Ford took as, over? As far as I'm concerned... I mean, I mean, Dalton McGuinty and Kathleen Wynne froze hospital budgets, cut the pay of doctors. Well, well, cut the I'm pay saying, of doctors by, and froze hospital Doug budgets. I'm going his government's record while they've been in government. As I said, have mm. you ever tried to listen to the guy? He's as dumb as a truck. Well, he, he, I don't think he can think for himself. Okay. So, uh, as opposed and, and to the what? I don't want what, anybody the, with that level of intelligence gotcha, gotcha. Okay. running the government. As opposed to what? The, the, the astrophysicist in the prime minister's office right now? <laughs> Derek in Ottawa. Derek. Sorry, I'm going to dump on Doug Ford as well. I was just looking at the polls yesterday. If you look at the Liberal NDP, uh, Green and Conservative support, it adds up to 95. Mm-hmm. And the question becomes, where's the other 95? And I'm, I, I know I'm in a minority position here, but I think the other 5% is going to the New Blue or the Ontario Party. Right. And I think it's people pissed off from Doug Ford locking down for so bloody long. I mean, he was the lockdown king as far as premiers go. Yeah. And if you look, it's interesting because he had 35% support in the poll, I believe. And in 
the election, he had 40% support. So he's lost 5% of his support, according to my calculations, um, just from his stupid lockdowns. And, you know, the way he handled COVID, I mean, he wanted police to randomly stop people and question them. I mean, he told people not to go to their cottage, then he went to his cottage. Yeah. And I think that's cost him. Okay. Um, one more one more thing, Rob, um, yeah. if it's okay. Um, I'm not a Green Party supporter. I would never vote for the Green Party. But about a year ago or six months ago, you had Anna Mee Paul on your show, and she was really well-spoken. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest. The Green Party has no chance of forming government. Yeah. But she was really, really good. I'm going to make an ask. Could you, could you throw the leaders of the Ontario Party and the New Blue Party on your show at some point and put them on the hot seat and ask them some questions so I can decide which one I'm going to vote for? Yeah, I'm not going to make you any promises, sir. No, I'm not promising. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe. Maybe we'll do a whole week where we, we'll interview all the fringe parties. We'll have the commies on and the pinkos on and the rhinos on. we we'll have them all on. Karen in Stittsville. Karen. Hi. Hi, Karen. I would like to say um, I don't mind that Pierre has a place. Okay. And I'd like it to be investigated about the, the, the woman that's given away all that money, and it should be investigated mm. because if she's given away millions of dollars... And to the tourism industry. Area, to the tourism industry. Yeah. Well, she has a business that rents cottages yeah, so in, the, in, the, in the same riding. Yeah. So I'm saying <laughs> if that was a conservative, they would have it investigated and it'd be on Splash Dollar. Oh, it'd be, on, it'd be already be on W5 already. And the other thing, I know it has nothing to do with it, but I would like it to know where is all of uh, uh, Justin Trudeau's money? Is it offshore? <laughs> I'd like well, to know. Um I don't know, you know, Mr. Yeah, Trudeau, Mr. well, I don't know all of his money. I mean, there have been investigations into how much money Justin Trudeau actually has. Uh, most notably by the Globe and Mail. Uh, in fact, I would I, I would suggest to you we know about as much about Pierre Polyev's real estate holdings now as we know about Justin Trudeau's real estate holdings. And Justin Trudeau's been prime minister for, what, six plus years. The last time I can remember anything being in the news media about Mr. Trudeau's fortune was uh, reporting in the Globe and Mail from... Uh, Bob Fife and Steve Chase, but that you know that was years ago, years ago, twenty seventeen, five years ago. They were all over the fact that Ms. and it was a legitimate news story because Mr. Trudeau used an estate trust to save taxes on his inheritance. Because you may remember this at the time, he had accused small business owners of structuring their businesses in ways that would shield them from taxes and the Globe and Mail's reporting uncovered that he was using the exact same strategy totally legal uh, to lower his own family's tax burden Mr. Trudeau's disclosure this is from the Globe and Mail 2017 Mr. Trudeau's disclosure form for the ethics commissioner says here in now, this was five years ago. He earns dividends from a numbered company, blah, 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 Canada Inc. He has sole ownership of another numbered company that holds significant interest in another company. It's another numbered company. The prime minister is also joint owner with his brother, Alexandre, in another numbered company in Quebec, which the corporate profile says is activities... Uh, in the Laurentian countryside include real estate development and the production and sale of timber and firewood. The most recent evaluation for the property 2017 to 2019 was 2.73 million. It includes two lakes and a cottage designed by Arthur Erickson. The prime minister was also an equal owner in Pierre Trudeau's historic Art Deco house in Montreal, evaluated at 2.35 million. One can only imagine what it's worth now. Ownership of the property was fully transferred to Alexandre in 2005. It's not known what the prime minister's brother paid him for his share of the home. But it, he runs the country, right? Pierre Polyev doesn't run the country. He won't be running the country anytime soon. But I'm just, my only point would be we know a, a, as much about Polyev's vast real estate empire as we know about the prime minister and he's been in office for six years dustin in leeds grenville dustin 
Hi. Hey, Rob. Good Hi. to hear from you. Hi. Thank you, sir, um, for calling. I just wanted to mention, I am I drive on the road a lot for work, and yeah. I constantly see people texting, calling on the road while driving, and it always kind of uh, uh, puzzled me because modern cars, most of them, uh, have Bluetooth or hands-free devices, so yeah. I, just, I don't understand why so many people in the modern day take that risk. I guess that's just a little public service announcement. For yeah, me. it's a scourge. It's a scourge. Yeah. And, it, you know, and, it's not like they can hide it. You can always tell somebody when they're texting and driving, right? You can well, yeah, tell. Yeah, because they're on the other side of the road. They're on the other side of the road, or they're looking down at their knees. Yeah, and right. to the previous caller who said that you can't get uh, free entertainment these days, um, We've got it right here on the Rob's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. All right, Dustin. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That's Take true. Care. That's true. It's the public airwaves. It's the public airwaves. I'm just trying to be a, a steward of the FM dial. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. Grab a spoon, class. Dream coach. The sun is calling. Change with one air. I was so excited when I found out that I was given this grant to be able to make this this concert because I knew it was going to be the first opportunity that I was able to play these songs for others. You know, this album was recorded really, truly in isolation. Like everybody else, we were locked down for a bit. So you're going to see, I think, the joy of playing live, of being together. For me, as someone who owns a business in Ottawa that's directly working with music, I own a recording studio, it is important because it gives a sense of confidence in terms of having support from a lot of different places. Uh, we all know in Canada there are all kinds of city, provincial and federal uh, people who provide funding for artists and just seeing how invested Ottawa is and expanding the reputation of Ottawa as a music and entertainment city, running a business in that city, just it makes you just feel better that someone's going to support you, help you and have your back. Well, firstly, I'm seeing friends that I haven't seen in two years, so that is kind of stabbing me in the heart a little bit. But I'm also just so happy to be able to make art with all of these friends again. And I've been treated like an absolute rock star from the moment I just kind of knocked on the door and said, hey, can I unload my gear? Uh, everybody's so helpful, and you're just used to kind of dragging all your stuff around, and it's such a hard business to be in. So this is a dream come true for any local artist who gets to participate in a series like this. Oh, I, I feel like I need to keep pinching myself. It's an amazing experience and opportunity for us, so thank you so much. It's been a long couple months. Uh, our last show was... Uh, in December. This is the first time we've actually been in the same room together since. So it's, uh, it's really an amazing opportunity for us and the beautiful theater and to have Rogers here and thank you, oh Mike, and so it's a dream come true. I'm here with one of my best friends, Alex, and we haven't performed in almost two years because of COVID and it feels really good to be back on a big stage like Meridian, and I'm uh, really honored that you guys invited me here today. Having an organization that lets the artists do their thing with such a range of styles and influence and to kind of have that ability to meet the public and to meet the people who would listen to them can't be overstated so super excited about it i know a lot of musicians in town and a lot of music lovers in town who are really excited about it too so i mean it's it's an event in which there's talk you know there's a lot of buzz around it and i wouldn't be surprised if it goes on for a long time and does a lot of great things for for local musicians and connecting them with the listeners that love them Time to talk back on the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. Last chance to have at me for the week. Friday free for all talk back hour here on the Rob Snow Show on City News. I enjoyed the conversation this morning. Uh, Barry in Ottawa. Good morning. You're on City News. Barry. Yes, uh, Rob. I, I, I don't understand this, this common sense that we expel Russian dif uh, diplomats from Canada. Yes. Yes, it is. Yes. 
so why are we not doing it? <laughs> I, I don't know, sir. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Oh. I don't have an answer to that. I, I, it's puzzling to me. It seems, you know, we have, we're, we have a lot of tough talk, but um, do we really back it up? You know, we, we're that war is more than two months old now. We're just around to sending some howitzers to the Ukrainians, right? So. But, you know, the, the Russians, uh, they said uh, the, they're, they don't want to see all these Canadians uh, go to Russia. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They've, ba- they've banned Bob Ray, the uh, ambassador to the United Nations, our ambassador to the United Nations, not allowed to go to Russia. But uh, the mayor, too, Jim. The mayor, Watson. yeah, the mayor, the premier, whatever. Like, are, is anybody, you know, is anybody really planning, a, you know, a, a Siberian vacation anytime soon? <laughs> <laughs> Not me, anyway. But, um, yeah, it would seem to be the very least we could do. You summon yes. the ambassador, you say, you know, you've got 24 hours to pack your bags. Get out of here, rummy. You right? You know? Yes. Yeah. But, you know, we're very good. As Melanie Jolie, our foreign affairs minister, said, Barry, we're very good at convening meetings. That's our strength. We can call a meeting. We're not very good at anything else, but you need somebody to call a meeting? Call the Canadians. Albert in Ottawa. Albert, you're on City News. Uh, Good morning, Rob. Yeah, hi, Albert. Um, uh, Real quick, I just uh, a sad day for hockey fans with the the passing of Guy Lafleur, a real gentleman, great hockey player. Yeah, yeah. And and I called, and I'm going to try to talk off the top of my head because uh, I'm going to go back a month and an article in the National Post that I read about charities. Since 2015, the number of charities in Canada have, I I believe, um, tripled from 2015 to 2020. But the audits from 2015 to 2020, and back in 2015, I'm going off the top of my head in the article, I believe there was about 4,000 audits on the charity. But two years ago, there was only 1,500 audits on charities, though there was a massive increase in charities. Now, um, all this through, um, all this, of course, through the Trudeau years, okay? Yeah. But the reason I'm calling you today, Rob, um, in, in an article this week, um, um, we have a group of these charities that now are, are using the racist card, okay? And they're coming out and they're basically using the racist card. They feel that uh, the CRA is, um, is, is looking into them. Um, um, uh, wrongly, and they bring it up the racist card, and it's unfortunate because um, I don't think any of these charities should have uh, any type of protection if there's fraudulent stuff going on. These charities, okay. uh, and um, okay. there's taxes that are owed. Those taxes are owed to Canadians, and, oh, okay. and they should be investigated thoroughly. All right, Albert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yep. Take this call here, Robert in Ottawa. Robert. Hello. Um, Hello. If I could go out on a limb for a second to defend the crown here, um, oh, yeah? if there was one minister I would defend, it would be the minister of national revenue, the honorable. Oh, yeah. That's Diane. a tough job, the minister of national revenue. That's a real killer of a job. That one. That's a really prestigious cabinet gig. Sit back and uh, watch the money roll in. Yeah. Um, well, I had a problem with the CRA once. Yeah. Big argument, and I. You know, mm-hmm. was really annoyed, and you know me, I like to fight. I know. Um, so I wrote to her, and she was ultra helpful. She was. A, she is a, the minister a herself really got back to you. The minister herself got back to you. The minister yes. did really. Yes. Really. Well, my father was senior rulings national revenue, oil mines and yeah. resource taxation. Okay. So he worked for thirty years under the minister. Right, right. Did you listen to the content? That I that I yes I spoke did. to you. Do you not find that you don't find that problematic? She's an professional. And you don't find you don't find she's, you, a, she's a fine professional. But you don't find this. I, I respect her, you and if I could her. defend okay. any minister of that crown, I would defend her because okay. she defended All right. me with the CRA. Gotcha. Okay, you it's a quid pro quo. Like. I do, I do indeed. Yeah, quid pro quo, I guess, Robert. Right. Okay. I don't know. I if if you're gonna investigate somebody's real estate holdings and do a major news story, uh, how about the Liberal cabinet minister who has a significant interest in the tourism industry and Gaspé has doled out millions and millions of dollars over election after election to 
the tourist industry in the Gas Bay. Just think it out loud. If you read one news story, if you have time this weekend, spend some time reading about the Trudeau government's plan to regulate the internet. There are two major reports in both the National Post and the Globe and Mail about this today. It's the front page story in the Globe and Mail this morning. Very important that we follow this. Newly released documents, quote, reveal Twitter Canada told government officials a federal plan to create a new internet regulator with the power to block specific websites is comparable to drastic actions used in authoritarian countries like China, North Korea, and Iran. Another private letter from the National Council of Canadian Muslims warns that the government's plans could inadvertently result in one of the most significant assaults on marginalized and racialized communities in years. Thousands of pages of criticism about the government's plan to regulate the internet, they've now been obtained by the newspapers thanks to access to information requests. And clearly, the Trudeau government wanted to keep all of this blowback under wraps, which you know what, in and of itself, is scandalous. It's very important to everyone who uses the internet in Canada, which of course is just about every Canadian. This is in the National Post today. Responses to the Liberal government's proposed online harms bill from companies including Microsoft, Twitter, and Canadian telecoms are among the hundreds of submissions Canadian Heritage refused to release. Previously withheld feedback includes a document from Twitter that warned the proposed framework involves proactively monitoring the content of Twitter, which would sacrifice freedom of expression to the government, to a government-run system of surveillance of anyone who uses Twitter. Government-run surveillance of anyone who uses Twitter. 422 submissions in all. Buried by the Trudeau government. Read those news stories, please. We'll have more to say on this on Monday, because I'm going to do some more reading about it over the weekend myself. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. Lottery license RAF one. The Calgary Stampede is a world-renowned festival celebrating wrangling, bull riding, and everything cowboy. But did you know that many people credit its origins to a black Canadian? Take a minute to meet John Ware. The word cowboy has racist roots. Before the American Civil War, white ranchers were called cowhands, but the enslaved black men and women working alongside them were actually referred to as cowboys to infantilize and disrespect black ranchers. The legend of cowboy John Ware is full of impressive feats and awe-inspiring skill, including the ability to train even the wildest broncos and easily hold a horse on its back. But the real story of John Ware is one that starts from more humble beginnings. Ware was born into slavery in the United States, gaining his freedom towards the end of the American Civil War in 1865. Ware's skills with cattle ranching developed as he traveled throughout the United States, eventually settling in a town southwest of present-day Calgary, Alberta, which made him one of the first black pioneers in the prairies. Over time, news of Ware and his amazing cowboy skills began to spread, and people came from across North America to witness his horsemanship and skills as a rancher. Eventually, Ware went on to own many of his own ranches. In 1892, he became the first man in Western Canada to earn the title of steer wrestler, and Ware's feats in local contests set the stage for the Calgary Stampede Rodeo we know today. In September of 1905, Ware was killed in a freak accident with his horse, and more than 10,000 mourners from across the region attended his funeral, making it one of the largest in Alberta history. Though his true story is difficult to separate from the legends around him, Ware's status as a respected forefather of cowboy skill continues to be celebrated today. Ware has dedicated monuments across Alberta, including several sites near his first ranch, a Calgary school in his namesake, and a building at the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology. 
1310 AM in Ottawa. And CJET 1011 FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News. Now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, April 22nd. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 8 degrees, 7 in Smith Falls, and here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Thurso, Quebec's Guy Lafleur has died at the age of 70. The electrifying winger from the Habs dynasty in the 1970s will be remembered for his on-ice style and his incredible skill. Here's City News reporter Simon Bennett. You can talk about Guy Lafleur's 560 goals, the five Stanley Cups, the two Hart trophies as MVP, but that doesn't tell the whole story. It was how he did it. Streaking down the wing at lightning speed, his hair flowing for all to see from moments like this. The yeah, tribute's pouring in. You heard from Justin Trudeau, and they will continue to pour in this morning. After his years in Montreal, he retired and was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame before coming back and playing again for the Rangers and Quebec Nordiques before retiring for good in 1991. He had been battling lung cancer since the return back in 2020. Guy Lafleur, the flower, was 70 years old. Simon Bennett, City News. Now it seems almost fitting Montreal's next game will be tomorrow night in Lafleur's backyard. That's Ottawa. Then on Sunday night, they're at home to the Boston Bruins. A tribute to Lafleur for that game will be stunning. City News Time, 11.01. Now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Any leftover cloud will move out. Sunshine for the afternoon for Ottawa. The Valley Smiths Falls today. The high about 12 degrees. Tonight, mainly clear in one. And for the weekend, quite a bit of cloud. Highs near 10, 11 degrees. For today, the high 12. And right now, it's 8 degrees in Ottawa, 7 degrees in Smiths Falls. And nearly two months of bombardment, Russian forces appear to be in control now of the strategic port city of Mariupol, although there is still a pocket of resistance in the Ukrainian city's steel plant. In the sprawling Azovstal steel plant, a few thousand Ukrainian soldiers have stubbornly held out, despite Russia's repeated demands for their surrender. Hiding with the soldiers are about a thousand civilians trapped and unable to leave. Ukrainian officials have repeatedly accused Russia of launching attacks to block civilian evacuations from Mariupol. However, just recently, some 80 people from the port city were able to escape to a neighboring city. Among them was 61-year-old Yuri Lulak. Hell is what's happening there. It's not possible just to retell it. Russians are killing people for nothing. Tanya and her husband Evgeny walked for five days with their four kids, aged from 6 to 12, until they got a ride in a vehicle that took them to a nearby town. It's very difficult when you see that your city, which has been built before your eyes and restored, becoming more and more beautiful, is dying. I'm Karen Chamas. City News Time 1103. Liberal Party leader Stephen Del Duca says a provincial government under his leadership will expand access to medication to prevent HIV transmission. The Liberals say the 2SLGPTQ plus community has been ignored by the PC government. Del Duca also also says barriers to things like gender-affirming surgeries will be reduced. The party goes on to promise to build 2,000 supportive homes for youth in that community and ensure that they are supported in schools. Ottawa firefighters called to Lower Town Brewery just before 9 o'clock this morning. An employee called 911 and reported a grease fire in the kitchen of the building on York between William and Dalhousie. The first crews on scene three minutes after the call was made found smoke and flames which had spread from the initial source a deep fryer. The fire was contained to that area of the kitchen though and quickly put out with minimal damage. No injuries were reported. The smoke was ventilated from the building. And you just have a few hours left now to pick up Chio 5050 lottery tickets. The winner takes half the pot and also gets a new Ford F-150 as well. The winner's share of the jackpot is now about 950000 bucks this morning. Deadline to buy tickets is midnight tonight, and the draw date is May 3rd. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's the opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. There are thousands of youngsters in this land who want to play hockey just like Jean Beliveau. There's one they're calling the new Beliveau. 
His name is Guy Lafleur. Here comes Acton over the line. Lafleur with a long whistler. Because uh, I was drafted by the Montreal instead of being drafted by the Oakland Seals. Because <laughs> uh, Jean was my idol and uh, the Montreal dynasty was a great, great honor. Guy Lafleur put it just inside the pipe. Lafleur, what a great score. Coming out rather gingerly on the right side. He gives it into Lemaire back to Lafleur. It's the top story in the country. It transcends sports. Montreal Canadiens legend Guy Lafleur, dead at the age of 70, as we welcome hockey historian Liam McGuire back to the Rob Snow Show on City News. Good morning. Hey, Rob. How are you? Oh, well, you know. uh, Tough day. Tough day. Knew it was coming, but uh, the inevitability was there looming large on the horizon, and... uh, and then it uh, reared its ugly head today. So I just, uh, I, I, I just feel a piece of me as, uh, as a hockey fan has, has died today too because I grew up with him, uh, idolizing him as a kid and right through his whole career. And then he became a friend and, and we worked together. And uh, so it's, uh, it, uh, it's a sad day, man. Very sad day. Yeah. What was he like? <laughs> he was awesome. He, he, uh, uh, he, I just, uh, I just tell people he had a great sense of humor. Uh, he, he loved to, uh, he loved to laugh and have a good time. He was engaging. Uh, he, he wasn't a guy going out and looking for the big crowds. And I wouldn't say necessarily that I found him shy per se, but he, he, he wasn't an introvert. But he, he, he wasn't an extrovert either necessarily. I think he understood his role. You know, I, I think it just it was assimilated into it first as a player and then and then just became part of that lore that he saw out of the people that came before him, whether it be Belleville and Rocket Richard, the two most notable in certainly in his lifetime, because Morenz died before any of anybody was born, really, other than other than the rocket, well, Jean was just five years old when Morenz passed away, so or six, I guess. But uh, he was uh, he's a fun guy to be around. I just understood his place, you know, understood what he uh, what he meant, I think, to fans and and uh, the sport of hockey in general. And and he just never said no. He was gracious with his time for autographs and pictures and. Uh, what he did four years ago for a dying man in Shawville, um, uh, Guy flew up in, a, in his own in a helicopter uh, with two friends, picked me up, flew me up there with him. We arranged it through the uh, man's daughter. Guy agreed to do it uh, uh, on his time and his dime as one of the most gracious, maybe the most gracious act I've ever seen in the history of my life performed by somebody of his stature to do what he did that day. If you can think about that, Shawville's not that far from where you are right now, Rob, or right. even me yeah. here uh, south of the city. And he flew up from Montreal in a, in a $3 million helicopter. Like this thing was just an unbelievable. He, of course he had his pilot's license. He was the actual pilot. Picked me up, <laughs> flew me up to Shawville right. in this helicopter, spent 90 minutes with this man who, who was 71 when he passed and now Guy at 70. So I find that ironic, but that's just the way I could speak about the guy's generosity and what he meant to, uh, to so many people on the ice. Just watching him play was, was, was almost a religious experience. So tell us a little bit about his story from Thurso. How does he end up as a Montreal Canadian? How does he get there? Well, uh, you got to thank Sam Pollock for that. You know, the, the, the NHL draft only started in 1963, uh, and it was only players that were drafted who hadn't already signed A, B, or C forms. <clears throat> so there wasn't, you know, it was slim pickings, and there was only a couple of rounds typically, but some big names were t- taken in those years. But it was never really thought of as the foundation of of the league and that changed in 69 when it became a universal draft and sponsorship of all junior teams ceased. Guy Lafleur was playing as a junior with the Quebec Ramparts at the time. Sam Pollock, of course, aware of what he had in his backyard and, and arranged the year before to get the California Seals first pick, hoping, thinking that they would finish last 
And that deal was actually consummated on my birthday. Uh, I turned 11, May 22nd, 1970. I remember when that they announced the trade that Montreal had picked up uh, the first pick, the Seals' first pick. What happened was, in the trade, they sent uh, Billy Hickey to the Seals, who started scoring big time, and the Seals actually moved out of the basement. So Sam Paula completed the transaction on January 26, 71, which was, I always remember, because it was Wayne Gretzky's 10th birthday, and he traded Ralph Backstrom from the Canadians to the Los Angeles Kings, which essentially gave L.A. enough fuel to move back ahead of California, ensuring that the Seals finished last, ensuring that Montreal had first pick in the draft that summer in 71 in Montreal, the Queen Elizabeth Hotel, and uh, Sam Pollock selected Guy Lafleur, And that's how he became a Montreal Canadian. And uh, <laughs> thank God for that, for Hab fans. And, uh, and, and really, I'm not sure what he would have done in California. He probably still would have become a great player, but I think it was much more mystical and magical and uh and incredible and was uh, the success in liam in montreal was it instantaneous no 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 he, he had a decent first season you know 29 goals then he, but then he went down to 28 and then his third year 21 uh you know in 73 74 and montreal got beat first round by the rangers again um it, it, it uh yeah ken dryden had shot out uh contract dispute with sam pollock uh, things are not good nor for him he had met a young lady, they had gotten engaged, and her father actually had a financial interest in the Quebec Nordiques, and they made a huge, huge run at trying to sign Guy in the WHA. And I'm sure he contemplated it, mm. but uh, he decided instead to uh, get married. He decided to take the helmet off because he had worn it the first three years, and he signed a five-year deal with the Montreal Canadiens, and the rest is history. He just took off. He took the torch from Bobby Orr, and he became the best player in the world on skates for six consecutive years. Okay, and tell us about those teams and how he fit in with those teams. Well, he was the straw that stirred the drink. I mean, he, he, he moved the needle. He was the guy. I, I was The first game I ever went to, Rob, was a Saturday night. I was 15 years old, May 1st, 1975. It was a playoff game against the Buffalo Sabres. And Montreal won 7 nothing. They lost that series, but they won that game 7 nothing. Guy Lafleur got his first playoff hat-trick. I was there in the building. And, and he, he scored his third goal on an end-to-end rush on a delayed penalty. I, I thought the roof was going to come off. I mean, he, he wasn't just fitting in. He, he, was, he became the straw that stirred the drink. He brought along Steve Shutt with him, Pete Mahovlich. You still had Yvonne Cornway flying, but Guy became the straw that stirred the drink. He went there anticipating when he touched the puck, when he got the puck, when he crossed the blue line, if he had control of the puck. You knew two things were going to happen. He was going to hit the top of the circle, and he was going going to hammer one about 120 miles an hour with a wood stick from the top of the circle low on the stick side and nine out of ten times he was going to score the shot was almost indefensible and in the forum especially on a saturday night for a young boy from the cars road uh 15 16 17 years of age it 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 was it, it was a religious experience man it was awe inspiring like it took your breath away and I used to leave that building late at night after a game, and I'd try to be the last guy out. I had the security. I said, hey, Liam, you got to go. They all got to know me. And, and uh, I, I, I just never wanted to leave. I wanted to stay and just find a place to sleep and wake up at practice the next day just to watch the team practice, watch Guy shoot. And it was a magical, magical, electric, incredible time to be a hockey fan, especially if you were a Montreal fan. But even if you weren't, you got a chance to go to the forum at that time. Yeah. And so many people have messaged me today that were not fans of Montreal. And you can't, look, come on. Uh, it was like cheering for, uh, not cheering for Boston and not liking Bobby Orr. How would you not like Bobby exactly. Orr? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, you know? no, of course. Or, yeah. or, Lee, or, yeah. or Dave yeah. Keon with the Leafs. Everybody loved Keon as a player. These guys played the right way too, Rob. You know, they played the right way. They weren't running guys from behind. They weren't going for bad. They weren't sticking guys in the head. They went out and played the game the right way, and they played it at the highest level imaginable. And that's why they had the impact that they did on all of us. And I was just so fortunate to have done my, my whole life was with Guy. I was 12 years old when he started. That's one of the most impressionable ages you can be in your life is 12, 13. So it's it's... It's devastating uh, lot what, what today, do you, what do you know think coming. Uh, it's going to be a hockey night in Canada tomorrow with the Ottawa Senators, Montreal Canadiens. 
but what 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 awaits us in the days ahead do you think in terms of um what's going to happen in montreal when when john beliveau passed i mean it was um yeah, it was like a state funeral, basically, right? Uh, so it was yeah. actually a state. Uh, the Rocket Richard's funeral was a state funeral, and and it was treated that way. It was actually done as a state funeral. Uh, Bel- Belleville's was very close to it as well. I mean, uh, I went to both services, and that city will shut down. You you will see an unbelievable thing tomorrow night. I mean, there's there, on Sunday night. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, in Montreal or Saturday, I guess they're playing here, right? In Ottawa. Saturday, they, yeah, Saturday yeah. they're playing here, and then Sunday Montreal's back at home on Sunday. Yeah. Back at home. So yeah. I mean, the, you know the way the Habs do it. I mean, the, the late Ted Blackman said it best. There's only two entities in the world that do the pomp and pageantry. And that's the House of Windsor and the Montreal Canadiens, and that's what you're going to see on Sunday in Montreal. I mean, this is the this is the final man of Mount Rushmore of Montreal Canadiens that is passing away, and Guy Lafleur. And I mean, it's Howie Morenz, Rocket Richard, John Bellevue, and Guy Lafleur. And now Guy's gone, and he's the fourth guy in that Mount Rushmore for Habs. And it'll it'll be um, it'll be something special. You you can rest assured. If anybody remembers. Um, his final night in Montreal as a player, either both with when he was with the Habs and also when he came in as a member of the Quebec Nordiques. And then the next night, they played back in Quebec, um, actually against Montreal as well. They had a home and home on the final night, uh, final weekend of the season. And it was, it was unbelievable. They had an hour and a half in, in, in Quebec City pregame ceremony. Jeanette Renault, the whole nine yards. It was unbelievable. You'll see something special on uh, you'll see something special on Sunday in in Montreal, guaranteed. Look, I know it's been a you know a, a difficult emotional day for you, and you're probably really busy. I can't thank you enough for sharing so many memories that you have uh, with us here today, Liam. Thanks again. Thank thank you, Rob, for having me on. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Liam McGuire, hockey historian. This is the Rob Snow Show. We'll talk about uh, a little bit more about Guy Lafleur. And talk about the Ottawa Senators, what's ahead for them, uh, as well what they may be planning to pay tribute to Guy Lafleur. Uh, Steve Warren is our weekly contributor on Ottawa Senators hockey, and that's coming up next here on City News. Whispers in the wind. And destruction to confuse all of it. Chitter chat, hear the chitter chat. Haters ain't about it, and they only chitter chat. Chitter chat, chitter chat, hear the chitter chat. Cowards talk the loudest, and they only chitter chat. Chitter chat, chitter chat, hear the chitter chat. Haters ain't about it, and they only chitter chat. Chitter chat, chitter chat, hear the chitter chat. Cowards talk the loudest, and they only chitter chat. First they talking quiet. Now they talking loud. Before they gave me dabs, now they never come around. Still they walking silent, hiding with the crowd. See the hate of chat, yet they never hold it down. Slandering my name, trying to bring a shame. The truth will set you free, so forget about the games. Time to get it out the way, save my energy today. Brush that dirt up off the shoulder, walk away from the hate. Nah, 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 no, they ain't never been through all of this. Seeing you succeed, but try to ruin your biz. Try to bruise all of it, so you lose all of it. Deception and destruction to confuse all of it. Chitter chat, hear the chitter chat. Haters sing about it, and they only chitter chat. Chitter chat, chitter chat, hear the chitter chat. Cowards talk the loudest, and they only chitter chat. Chitter chat, chitter chat. Hear the chitter chat. Haters ain't about it, and they only chitter chat. Chitter chat, chitter chat. 
Hear the chitter chat. Cowards talk the loudest and they only chitter chat. Chitter chat, chitter chat. Hear the 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 chitter chat. Strong voice. Strong opinions. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Continuing our reflections on the incredible career of Montreal Canadiens legend Guy Lafleur. Steve Warren is back with us of the Sense Nation podcast, SenseNationHockey.com. He's with us every Friday morning. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. You're a big Guy Lafleur fan. Absolutely. I was when you a were a kid, fan. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was a big Hab fan in the 70s, and uh, yeah, Guy Lafleur was king of Saturday night in those days. He was. He was, eh? Okay. What was it about him, Steve, for you? Well, he was the best player in, in what was uh, the dynasty of the era. He yeah. was so skilled. He seemed to be faster than everybody on the ice and always a, a, this uncanny way of scoring the big goal and he also was just so memorable because you know and and probably today's hockey fans can't appreciate it because helmets have been mandated for a very long time but just the, the cool way that he just streaked down that right wing the the long hair flowing and uh yeah. he was just i don't know he was just a rock star is the uh, best yeah. way to put it he was just so fun to watch every single night yeah like i wasn't a habs fan i didn't even grow up a habs fan i grew up a bruins fan but um how could you not like Guy Lafleur, right? Like, just the style. I mean, it's just more than his stats and more than whatever. It's just he was cool. <laughs> you know, he was just he's just a cool, cool guy. Yeah, um, I think that's, that's fair. Cool rock yeah. star, whatever you want to say. And I've heard that again and again since the news of his passing yeah. broke this morning. That uh, yeah, I hated the Habs, but man, how could you not respect you the not? hell out of Guy Lafleur? Yeah, for sure, for sure. So it's Habs, by the way, and uh, sends tomorrow in Ottawa. And I'm sure there'll be some kind of tribute at Canadian Tire Center uh, to mark the passing of Guy Lafleur, for sure. But there'll be a lot of Montreal Canadiens fans in the stands anyway, right? So, uh, and then when once the team gets, the Habs get back to Montreal, it will be, my goodness, I don't know what the tribute will be like when the Habs play on Sunday. But... Um, Let's talk about Senators hockey a little bit. I looked at the NHL standings this morning. We have, what, about a week to go, Steve, or so, in the regular season, right? Last game is a week from tonight for the There you go. Okay. So currently the Senator have 65 points, but it looks like the wild card teams will have about 100 points, maybe a little more than 100 points at the end of the season. To, to get in the wild card spot to make the playoffs. So that's, um, gosh, you think about that. That's, that means the Sens have to win, like, what, 15, 16, 17 more games, maybe? What are the chances that the Senators could be, say, a 100-point season team as soon as next season? Is that realistic, do you think? Well, put in those terms, it is going to be tough, no question. Um, on the one hand, I'd say that if there's a, a bad NHL team that's most poised for a big jump next season, I think it's the Senators. Okay. And, I, and I say that because I think they, they should have been better this season. Uh, next season, you're not going to have COVID slowing them down. Uh, they're not going to have to shut down their schedule for two weeks. And I find it really hard to imagine that they're going to have as many injuries as they did to so many key guys. Like, imagine a full season out of Batherson, Shabbat, Pinto, Norris, Connor Brown. You'll have a Matthew Joseph for the whole year. you got Jake Sanderson, who should have a good impact as a rookie. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe the biggest thing of all is that your young core is going to be a year older and, and one, one year closer to their prime. Yeah, maybe a little more certainty and stability in goal, too, Steve, right? Uh, they did sign 
Forsberg to the to the contract extension. They're paying him pretty good money, and uh, they've gotten good work out of him this season. So I don't know what I don't know what's going to happen to Murray, but um, like right now, you'd have to think Forsberg's the number one guy. He's earned it if anybody has. I would. Say. He's been very good. He earned yeah. that contract for sure. What the gray area is with him is he's never been anointed as a number one in meaningful games before. I'm encouraged by what I've seen, but until you go out and do that, yeah. then it, it has to remain a gray area. So that's certainly one of the question marks for the team for next season. All right, let's talk about the the draft lottery. I will be right up front. I don't like the draft lottery. I don't like the way they run it. I don't like the way they do it. I think it's silly. Uh, but what does it mean for the Sens, the draft lottery? Well, it depends where they end up finishing, obviously. they got five yeah. games left to go, but right now, let's look at it from that perspective. I think there's a good chance they stay where they are. I don't think they move up at all. They might move down a couple, but right now they're seventh last overall. If they stay there, their chance of getting first overall is 6.5%. Mm. And I believe, and this is part of that, I agree with you, I don't like the draft lottery, and part of it is because it's so damn confusing, but I think they won't drop any lower than ninth overall. Okay. So still a good pick. Still a good pick. They'll get a top no doubt, pick. No doubt. No doubt. Yep, yeah. I just don't like the way they do it. I don't know why they just don't. Maybe we're just old and we're purists, Steve. Uh, you know, if you finish last, you get to pick first. Well, I don't know what was wrong with that. But nevertheless, it worked for ages, but they don't do it that way anymore. All right. Well, the NFL seems to get by okay with it, yeah, right? Yeah. So 67th loss last night. Uh, if I look at a team that COVID really like stole some really good years, it's the Ottawa 67s because they were poised for greatness. The Ottawa 67 and COVID just ended a really uh, a great team's chances. They lost last night game one uh, against North Bay, right? Is it North Bay they're playing? Correct. Italian, yeah, yeah. yeah. But how, uh, do they have any chance against this team, North Bay, or what? Uh, well, I think they're going to be in tough. They go in as the seventh seed and uh, lose game one. Uh, I think they can make a series out of it based on what we saw last night. It was a close game. It was tied at one in the third. Very controversial goal by North Bay. You had uh, North Bay's Mitchell Russell on a breakaway, and he falls and just cleans out Ottawa's goalie, Max Donoso, knocked him in the puck into the net, and so that ends up being your game winner. It was disappointing. But, I mean, really, again, the team is the seventh seed in the East right now after, well, there could have been a Memorial Cup championship in there yeah. somewhere in the last two, three years. Yeah. Um, they have 16 guys now, though, who've never been to an OHL playoff game until last night unless they bought a ticket. Yeah, exactly. All right, Steve, uh, just a reminder to our listeners, two things. The Toronto Blue Jays are tied for the best record in baseball right now. So there's that. And they're on City News tonight at uh, 8 o'clock against the Houston Astros on 101.1 FM at 1310 AM. So they, and the pitcher had a, he had a beauty last night against the Red Sox. So, Steve, we will talk next week. Thank you, Rob. Wrap up this Senators season together. Thank you. Uh, Steve Warren of the Sens Nation podcast, SensationHockey.com. I'm Rob Snow, Queens Park Week in Review with the uh, clock ticking down to the election call. That's coming up right after the news on City News. The Hi, I'm Daniela Lard, and I am a proud Ottawa born and raised singer songwriter, and I'm part of Encore Ottawa 3. I think that this is the first time that I have unveiled a set of music that's all new music. I'm usually pulling from some of my older projects like Chameleon and Passing Notes and trying to feature songs from both of those, but the set you're about to hear has been all written within the last year. So I'm really excited to share that with Ottawa and share that with the world. Sometimes it feels like, feels like we're falling. What does it mean? Well, firstly, I'm seeing friends that I haven't seen in two years, so that is kind of stabbing me in the heart a little bit. But I'm also just so happy to be able to make art with all of these friends again. And what it means being in a venue like this for a local artist, I mean, Centerpoint Theatre is 
<laughs> premiere. I, I've been treated like an absolute rock star from the moment I just kind of knocked on the door and said, hey, can I unload my gear? Uh, everybody's so helpful and you're just used to kind of dragging all your stuff around and it's such a hard business to be in. And this is a dream come true for any local artist who gets to participate in a series like this and to also have access to an incredible film and audio crew. It's the dream. I'm too small to have it and it's not just me. I really hope you like the music and just come and see all of the talent that Ottawa has to offer. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, April 22nd. Good morning, I'm Danielle Bain. Right now in Ottawa, it's 10 degrees, mostly cloudy skies, 8 degrees in Smith Falls. Here's what's making news this hour. One of the Montreal Canadiens' most electrifying players in the franchise's history has passed away. Guy Lafleur has died at the age of 70 due to his battle with lung cancer, according to his wife, who posted on social media. The Habs legend won five Stanley Cups, four of them in a row in the 1970s. A tribute is expected at the Canadiens' next home game Sunday night against the Boston Bruins. The Ontario government is investing over $123,000 to support older adults in Nepean in regards to greater social inclusion, volunteerism and community engagement. Nepean MPP Lisa McLeod says the investment will keep older adults more safe and give them the support they need. Six retirement homes in the Nepean area will be receiving some of the funding. Liberal Party leader Stephen Del Duca says a provincial government under his leadership will expand access to medication to prevent HIV transmission. The Liberals say the 2S LGBTQ plus community has been ignored by the progressive conservative government. Del Duca also says barriers to gender affirming surgeries will be reduced. And the Toronto Blue Jays are back on the field today against the Houston Astros in Texas. It's the first of a three game series. You can catch that game right here on City News 1011 FM or 1310. AM this evening. Dan, uh, City News Time, 1132. I'm Danielle Bain for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. The world is changing. So keep up with Rob. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's time for Queen's Park Week in Review. We're down in MPP this week, unfortunately. We have Donna Skelly, progressive conservative MPP, Flamborough, Glanbrook. Welcome back, Donna. Good morning. Yeah, it's great to hear from you. And uh, our good friend John Fraser, liberal MPP, Ottawa South. John, welcome back. Hey, Rob. How are you doing? I'm good. Are you going to play Jill this morning? I will be Jill. As you know, Jill is recuperating. <laughs> Jill had a heart attack, right? So yeah. he's, uh, he's recuperating, but he's said to be doing well on the mend. Yes. Still plans to be campaigning and everything like that. Uh, but we just couldn't find a, a substitute New Democrat. So I... I will be the dipper. I will be the dipper. I will be the one who will repeatedly say throughout the next 27 minutes, liberal Tory, same old story. I will be the one who will repeat my grandfather's line, who said the only difference between a conservative and a liberal is one's in and one's out. So, <laughs> and away we go. According to the public broadcaster this weekend, Mike Crawley, the correspondent down there, had his calculator out, and he added up all of the goodies that Doug Ford has promised in advance of the election call, and it totals some $10 billion. $10 billion. And right at the top of that list is the vehicle registration refund, 2020 to 2022, a $1.1 billion uh, goody canceling vehicle registration fees 2022 2023 1.1 billion dollars uh, and then the gasoline and fuel tax cut is another 645 million dollars but then there are some things that, and 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 this is what I want to get into is a lot of this stuff will be right at home I think in um, a liberal budget or a liberal pre-election package and if you're going to be critical of all of these um, pre-election goodies, John, then what would you do away with? 
I think that's the big question. Would you do away with a um, billion dollars for the hospital in Scarborough? Would you no. do away with a uh, billion dollars for St. Joseph's uh, Health Center? I think that's in I think that's in Hamilton, isn't it, Donna? Is that a Hamilton? Yes. That's well, there's in Hamilton? one in Toronto, but we did also have funding for the one in Hamilton. Right, almost a billion dollars to improve uh, internet for rural Ontario. Seven hundred and sixty million dollars for a retention bonus for nurses. Seven hundred million dollars to improve staffing and long-term care. Just uh, you know, what would you cut, John? Are you going to cut? Is that what you're going to do? Is that what the Liberals are promising to do? They would cut? Would they be cutters, John? Yeah, what, what I'd first like to see is what the government's fiscal plan is. If we haven't seen a budget, how, how do we know How do we know what's coming in? How do we know how, it's, how they're going to balance out? What's their path to balance? Is the announcement they made for St. Joe's and Hamilton and the Civic Hospital in Ottawa, the commitment that they made, is it on their 10-year capital plan? We don't know. They haven't dropped their budget. It's not going to be till next week. And then we're not going to get to debate it. But here's the reason they're waiting that long is before each election, the Auditor General has to review the budget and say, yeah, this looks good. It's okay. Well, they're waiting to four days before the election to put their budget out. How much time does that give the Auditor General? None. So you, you can go around and spread as much pixie dust as you want across the province, mm -hmm. but you got to show your books, and they're not showing them. How can you make a decision if we don't know what, what's coming in? What are your revenues? What's your long-term forecast? Right. Nothing. Okay. Zero. Okay. Yeah. So these might all be just, um, well, let me think, to, to, to quote Kathleen Wynne, you're thinking these might all just be stretch goals. Is that what you mean, John? Uh, what I'm saying is you just want to see are they grounded in reality? We, we will not do the 413. I can guarantee you that. All right. 100%. Well, we're going to do, we'll talk about the 413 a little bit later, but I don't want to get too off track. But uh, but the, but you're saying, why would you believe any of this stuff? Because none of it is in the budget. Is that what you're saying, John? There's no budget. There's, There's no, no budget. The Auditor okay. General doesn't have, right. a, doesn't have a... Doesn't have a document to um, to verify for okay. the residents of Ontario. Okay, long term care staffing six hundred seventy three million dollars, funding for correctional officers a half a billion, college and university tuition free almost half a billion dollars, General Motors two hundred sixty million, long term care in Toronto two hundred thirty five, long term care in Toronto two hundred twenty two, long term care various other locations two hundred five million. Uh, there was an announcement about long term care yesterday here in Ottawa through Briere Continuing Care. Uh, Donna, what? You're just making it all up, Donna? Just making no, it No, and we are going to have a budget, and it's coming out on Thursday, so everyone will have an opportunity to weigh in on uh, what we're proposing. But the investments that you're, we're talking about are investments that we've been making since the day we were elected, and part of it is because of the neglect of the previous government that John doesn't want to address. But let's face it, we knew because of COVID that the long-term care sector had been neglected. It was certainly highlighted uh, because of the pandemic. We also recognized, and, and it's, it's factual, 600, over seven years, the previous government, the Liberal government, built 611 net new beds. We had a wait list of over 40,000 people. Ontario now has 31,000 new beds in the works, and 28,000 upgraded beds. And that's only addressing a portion of the need in, in this province. We need millions and billions of dollars to address that. We, had, we inherited a system from the Liberal government that created a health care system that created and resulted in uh, hallway health care. We had to build more hospitals. We are allocating billions of dollars for hospitals. We allocated billions of dollars for mental health, addictions, and housing support, and that's, of course, over 10 years. We believe that these are the areas that we have to invest in when it comes to the auto sector. And it, and it began, again, right as soon as we were elected. 300,000 jobs in the manufacturing sector left Ontario okay. under the previous government. We now have $12 billion in new investments yeah. in, in, in the auto sector, and they're all in green vehicles, whether it's an electric vehicle itself, the manufacturing of the vehicle, or the battery, or accessing the um, the minerals that we need in those batteries. Okay. These uh, are investments so, that I said. All right, let me jump in. Uh, you know, Donna, I, I'm playing the dipper today, so I will agree with you that the Liberals did a terrible job. Now, nevertheless, <laughs> okay. 
don't right. even have to be a difference okay. to say that. Okay. Uh, in, the, in our local paper today, and this is uh, a very valid concern, and I think all, all voters remember the tragedy and the horror show of, of, of long-term care. So in our local newspaper today, uh, there's this, quote, critics are accusing the provincial government of ignoring hard-earned, uh, hard-learned lessons of the pandemic after awarding new licenses for hundreds of new and upgraded long-term care beds in Ottawa. So if it's happening in Ottawa, I assume it's probably happening elsewhere. In Ottawa, to private companies, three private long-term care companies, including one with among the highest death rates during the pandemic, are slated to build the bulk of new and upgraded long-term care beds in Ottawa. Uh, according to Paul Calandra, extended care Schlegel Villages and Southbridge Care Homes, which owns Orchard Villa. So, I mean, are we re- going to repeat the same old mistakes here if, if, if your government is reelected, Donna? You're going to no, give the hired, business we, to the same people that couldn't run it the first time around? Absolutely not. But under your NDP go- uh, party, <laughs> Rob, uh, I know you're a, you're a big supporter of the NDP. Um, under the NDP's uh, proposals, they would have all private sector, privately run um, long-term care facilities shuttered. We could not build... Hold on, John. Hold on. One at a time. Okay. We could yes. not afford to deal with the number of people that we need to, um, to, to home, house, in that sector if we didn't support the private sector in, in this in this particular in long-term care and we've also invested we've hired more um, inspectors we've hired more long-term care psws we're putting more psws in we've increased their their wages we have provided free training and schooling for psws to encourage more people to get it into the profession because we knew there was a shortfall we're also All right. increasing okay. daily care this is a huge issue this is something everybody I know. wanted I know. four and a half I know. hours I know. of care per day and we're on our way to meeting that target so no, I have no concern about that whatsoever. No concern. Okay. All right, John, go ahead. Uh, John, first of all, I'll, I'll defend Jill right now. Is and uh, is that no one's going to shutter any long-term care homes in this province? That's not going to happen. Here's the reality: 25 years ago, we started privatizing long-term care homes, and we did that for a variety of reasons. Governments wanted to get that off their books, and what's been clear from the pandemic is that profit and the care of our seniors. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked. So we can't keep going down that slippery slope. We can't keep building private long-term care homes. It's not going to work. What we have to do is have long-term care homes that are rooted in community, like over here at the Pearly. I know that they got awarded some beds. St. Pat's home. Okay. We act. You know, we have to go in a different direction. We can't. We can't keep doing the same thing because we're going to get the exact same results. Right. What did Einstein say? You know, it, you know, insanity is doing exactly the same thing and okay. expecting All right. a different All right. results. Let's let's talk about insanity. You know what insanity is? Is your leaders promise uh, to ban handguns and think that that is going to have any meaningful effect at all? on gun crime in big cities, whether that's Toronto, Ottawa, or what have you. Um, it's not nothing, but it's pretty darn close to nothing, John. Don't you think, John? No, I, I, this plan? I don't think so. I think, uh, no, I don't think so. I think if you take a look at, I mean, the current government wouldn't allow cities to move forward and ban handguns, to make their own choices about what they wanted to have happen inside their city mm-hmm. um you know it used to be that you know three quarters of our guns came from across the border the, the guns that were illegally sold now it's basically 50 50 people are domestically uh, getting these handguns and so how do you eliminate the problem you get them off the street what, what, what do you mean yeah. they're domestically not, getting these handguns in other words it's they're, they're being they're, they, they, the, the the seller of the gun is domestically acquiring a handgun mm-hmm. and then selling it. What does 50%. that mean? Domestically so words, acquiring. If you buy a gun here in Canada legally, that's that domestically acquiring a gun, and then you resell it, that's illegal. That's but dom- legally, acquired. are you saying legally, domestically acquiring a gun or illegally? No, you can legally right now acquire a handgun. 
Well, yeah, sure. happened, it's incredibly difficult. Part. It's not an easy process, though. It's not an easy no, process. Isn't. No, it isn't. Right. It's happening. But so, John, you're saying, I want to make sure, yeah. you're okay, saying you that ahead, 50% of the legal handguns in Ontario are being, are, are somehow no, making no, their way into the hands of the gun, of the gang members. No what, I, no, what I'm saying is, of the guns that are found in the Commission of Crime and on people who illegally have them, Half of those guns were sourced domestically. They didn't come across the border. So it's not so all of them. Well, it's how the are guns, they getting the in their guns, hands? The guns in commission of a crime. How are they getting in their hands? Uh, used to be sent, used okay. to be 75% but, okay, okay. but whether the they're border. whether they are domestically so not, sourced. No, no, hang on a second. I'm sorry, you push Don. back on this. You gotta push back on that is absolutely untrue. You talk to the police and they say over eighty percent of the guns used in crime are coming in from across the border, mostly the US. They are, they are, well, you show me a statistic and you show me any crime, uh, certainly the ones that were in Scarborough that Missy Hunter from your party was talking about and for, for Del Duca to stand there and take advantage of grieving families for a political photo op to announce something that will do nothing to address guns and gangs. We put $185 million into combat gang violence so that we can work with kids who are going to, uh, who are attracted to joining gangs. That will do something. That will make a difference. But to, to suggest you're going to ban legal handguns and that's going to do something, anything, to prevent gang-related death is absolutely nothing but nonsense. No, not, and a political, it, 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 it is an absolute, it was just yeah. for the photo op. That's all that was. But you no, tell no, me, John, how many, how many crimes can you point to where somebody was murdered by a gun that was... Uh, purchased legally in Ontario. Don, Donna, I will I will send you a, an do. article that talks about how guns are sourced. Ones that no, are no, I want to know which. Crime. No, 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 no. So what I'm trying to say, Donna, murders, Donna, Donna the actual me. the actual gun itself is the problem. It's the one that's getting used to kill people. Well, that's exactly. And these are That's why we're members off that the are smuggling them across the and border, John. This was not going to do I, a thing. What I tried to tell you is that's changing. And that's changing where only about 50% of them are coming across the border. And the other 50% are being sold here domestically by people who acquire those guns domestically. That's what I'm trying to say. All right. It's okay. changed over the last... And I think years. that's absolute nonsense. Okay, but whether... Wh it's not. But whether it is domestically or illegally smuggled across the border from the United States, is that person who is engaged in criminal activity going to say, I better not commit this crime because exactly. Stephen Del Duca banned handguns? <laughs> like, whatever, John. Doesn't make yeah, any really. sense. Come on. Well, you uh, get him off the streets. How? Okay. All right, we're kind of going in circles here. When we come back, housing affordability identified as... One of the top issues for voters ahead of the election. What are you going to do about it? What can we do to make housing more affordable? This is the Rob Snow Show. We're talking Queen's Park Weekend Review with our MPPs on the Rob Snow Show on City News. It's so important, and I know I, I, I do come on, I, I talk about this a lot, but, you know, every 60 seconds, somebody in Canada needs blood. And so it's important to keep reinstilling the message of donating and uh, continuing to get new blood donors to come into our system to support. Um, you know, we have one in two Canadians who um, are in need of blood at any given time, but only one in 81 people wow. actually donate. So we need to improve those statistics. Yeah, and, and you know, helping to improve those statistics, you guys are always coming up with, with new campaigns and, and you've got a new campaign now. Tell me, tell me about the campaign. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, no, I'm happy to. You know, it's it's kind of about Canadians. Um, we sacrifice uh, everything for people we know and for people we don't. Um, Canadians show up for other Canadians and uh, we do this out of the goodness of our heart. And right now, especially right now, uh, through the pandemic and, um, you know, the winter months and the snowstorms, uh, we've had a lot of cancelled appointments. Uh, we've mm. had, uh, you know, a, a decline in the number of people who are able to show up uh, for their appointments. Um, and right now, what we really need is for uh, everybody who's eligible to hear the call to show up for patients. So patients in Canada need blood. 
we want you to show up. We want you to uh, say we're here for you. And with currently only 4% of Canadians who donate blood, um, we want more people to show up and improve those numbers and uh, really uh, make sure that the, the hospital patients are comfortable and that they know that uh, blood will always be there for them when and where they need it. Yeah, and Jan, you mentioned the pandemic, right? And, uh, you know, that that probably, uh, you know, as you said, had uh, it's one of the biggest reasons why people perhaps have, have stopped. But you do have health and safety protocols, and we want to encourage people and let them know that those health and safety protocols remain in place. Let's talk a little bit about those. Absolutely. Well, first of all, our, our workforce, our uh, volunteers, every everybody who works within the blood donor clinic is fully vaccinated. Um, and uh, we have many wellness uh, procedures throughout uh, Step by Step. If you donated through the pandemic, uh, you'll notice the distancing, you'll notice the, the wellness stations, the health checks at the front end, uh, some more eligibility criteria, as you can imagine. Um, but all of it is just to make sure that the experience itself is is. Uh, safe and reliable and uh, now we need people to come in and uh, go through that process with us uh, so that the end outcome again is that uh, lovely unit of blood going to a hospital somewhere uh, to help a patient. Fair. Fun. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Back with part two, Queen's Park Week in Review with progressive conservative MPP Donna Skelly and liberal John Frazier. In an abacus uh, data poll this week, uh, it was asked, well, what are the top issues? Top issue for voters ahead of the election, the cost of living, the rising cost of living related to the inflation rate. And number two was housing, housing affordability. On housing affordability, I mean, every day there's a, a story about a home that's uh, gone for over asking by hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, more than a million dollars for a house probably where Donna lives now, I would suspect. It's uh, closing in on $900,000 here in the, in the Ottawa market. It's absolutely insane. Uh, what are, what, what's the government doing about it? And then what, what are the Liberals proposing to do about it? So, Donna, you, your party will be up for re-election. What are you doing to make housing more affordable? Well, it's something I'm really passionate about. And the first thing we have to do is recognize that one of the major contributors to these soaring, escalating costs is the, simply the lack of supply. So we have to build more homes. And that means making some tough decisions. We have an issue in Hamilton where council does not want to expand its urban boundary, despite the fact that hundreds of hectares of land uh, were purchased probably 30 years ago are not being farmed and they're sitting there vacant. They were part of the uh, white belt, but council is going against that. These are these are earmarked for not McMansions. Let's, let's take that off the table. These are earmarked for uh, high density, you know, two, three story homes, um, townhomes, etc. We have to build more homes. We also have to recognize that the lack of people in the skilled trades is contributing again to the cost of, of homes. So we, under Minister McNaughton, we've worked with unions. We are um, introducing the trades at grade one. We are uh, encouraging universities and colleges to uh, produce more programs, create more programs in the trades. We're encouraging more young people to get into the trade. And we're also, you have to recognize the other issue, of course, is the cost of the materials, which is really out of our hands. But it is expensive. Uh, the cost of lumber did escalate. It dropped a little bit, but it is still quite high, steel, et cetera. So that is contributing to these rising costs. But one area that we have tackled, and we're, um, we're not going to back down, and that is, asking municipalities to really expedite the whole planning process and the um, application process. Time costs money. There's a lot of red tape when you try to build a home in any municipality in Ontario. And we have to do everything we can to encourage municipalities to eliminate that red tape. We're giving them money to hire more. Okay. To hire more inspectors. <laughs> Whose dog, is that? Whose dog is that? 
Oh, Somebody, that's my dog, Louie. I'm that's your so dog? sorry. Okay. I'm going to try and get him to shut that's up. Okay, okay. Say. All right, you you go do that, Donna, and we'll... Um, what's the Liberal plan for housing, John? Well, I know that Louie doesn't like her plan. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, he doesn't have a backyard anymore. <laughs> he doesn't have a backyard. Look, I. it is not... Um, it's not an easy fix because it's going to take three levels of government. And it's not just affordable housing for um, for people to purchase a house, you know, you know, uh, my son or daughter or, you know, anybody's kids who are up there trying to buy a house. It's a pretty tough time. But it's a question around affordability of just being able to live, to get an apartment, to get a place. So, you know, I think, you know, we'll have our housing platform uh, coming out. I'm not going to scoop that. You know what Donna says about ensuring that municipalities uh, move more quickly through that planning process, I think is important. I think, you know, you know, I, I, it's, it's, you know it's, it's nice to say we're going to expand the urban boundary uh, and we have to do that to a certain extent at times. But at the same time, we actually have to build cities that, um, that make sense and that, you know, intensification, that's not an easy thing to do, um, to intensify, you know, in your inner core of your city, but it's you kind know, of a smart way to grow. And so I think, you know, it, it is supply. It's, and if, you know, anybody tells you that it's an easy fix, it's not. Um, but, you know, doing things like things, which I was hoping the government would have done in, in you know, Bill 109, helping first-time home buyers or a reinstating, uh, reinstating, I should say, reinstating, reinstating uh, rent control. Uh, and, you know, those are the kind of measures I think yeah, that'll help people with affordability, but it's going to take um, a number of, Good it's Josh. Take a while rent control. To fix it. Rent control is one of the reasons we're here in the first place with this star right. mess that we're in, John. For crying out That's loud, right. when are politicians going to learn this? Rent control is a disaster. That's um, right. It, it dis disincentivizes uh, the construction of rental units. That's why there's a shortage of rental units. There's no incentive for people to build rental buildings, John. That's why they built all those condos in the sky. Well, uh, people have, we're building buildings uh, before here in Ottawa South. Before this government came in? Yeah, now. Now, that. because the rules around rent control were changed. No, they did it before. All right, we got to go anyway. Uh, we'll have to talk about 413 some other day. <laughs> Donna's okay. happy about that. I suspect we'll be talking about it quite a bit in the weeks to come. Thanks to both of you. Have, have a nice week. weekend. Bye bye. Have a great John, week. Yeah, you too. Donna Skelly, progressive conservative, John Fraser, liberal. Uh, and I, Rob Snow, just. Doing the heavy looking on. Back on Monday after the 9 o'clock news, Sam is standing by with the Sam LaPrade Show on City News. The Rob Snow Show. Weekdays at 9 on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. The Rob Snow Show, brought to you by Myers Automotive Group. You're too sick to work. program is brought to you by Ignite.